So, yeah, just a few seconds. By the way, I'm in Capri. Ah. Uh, we have a program on neutrino and flavor physics here. Uh, luckily, that is, it is uh, taking place in a in a villa which uh, the University of Naples owns, uh, and uh, it's it's. A, really enchanting magnificent beautiful place it's amazing it's amazing to have a workshop here <laughs> anyway yes so in principle it's 10 20 maybe we can wait for for a minute or two okay uh just yeah i see i see the number of participants uh, is still growing Yes, unfortunately, our workshop is not in such a nice place. Uh, well, I don't know. So, so for you, it's in a nice place, right? For us, it's a it's a kind of enchanting place. Yeah, it's very special. I mean, this place. By the way, uh, Gorky lived here from 1906 to 1913. Really. And uh, one can see, uh, I mean, the, the villas in which he lived. Uh, and there are plaques usually indicating that. And he was visited by many, I mean, by many members of the Russian cultural elite at that time. Interesting. Hello, Sergey. Nice seeing Hello. you. Everything is fine. Where are you, Rubakov? Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Ah, nice to hear you, Valery. Yeah. Well, One good time, right? Of course, I would prefer to see you in person. <laughs> but let's hope that that will be possible in sometime in the near future. I think, I think video froze. Ah, yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, we can start. Good morning, everyone. This is our morning session. It will be devoted to leptogenesis. And uh, again, in the spirit of workshop, we'll start from uh, higher scales and then to the lower scales uh, of masses of sterile neutrinos or uh, energies when asymmetry is generated. And uh, we are glad to have our first speaker today. It's Sergei Petkov uh, from CISA. And he will be telling uh, about aspects of high scale leptogenesis. Uh, with low energy CP violation. Uh, so please start, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, of, I mean, it's, uh, I, want, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to participate in this uh, workshop on physics of the early universe. Uh, and it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, very nice to see the names of friends and colleagues uh, whom I knew since very long time who are organizers and participating in the workshop. Uh, okay, so I will talk about uh, some aspects of high-scale leptogenesis with, uh, where the CP violation is provided by uh, the low energy CP violating phases in the neutrino mixing matrix. Now, let me see, there is something, okay. Now, of, it is well known that uh, in order to explain the the existence of the baryon asymmetry of the universe, one has to go beyond the standard model, one has to introduce physics beyond the standard model. And arguably, arguably one of the most appealing solution is provided by the um, leptogenesis uh, to this problem, which uh, relates the generation and the smallness of neutrino masses to the generation of the baryon asymmetry of the universe. Now, as uh, all of you know, in its simple, simple, uh, it, in its simple realization, 
and lepton charge CP violating asymmetry is generated in the early universe in the CP and lepton charge non-conserving the case of the heavy Majorana neutrinos, so the type 1 CISO mechanism of neutrino mass generation. And then this asymmetry is converted into a baryon asymmetry by B plus L violating and B minus L conserving Svalian processes. Typically, the generation of baryon asymmetry takes place approximately at the mass of the lightest heavy Majorana neutrinos, especially in the case, in particular in the case of hierarchical spectrum of the heavy states. Now, in a series of papers, we have addressed the following questions. How long, how low can be the scale of non-resonant leptogenesis in the general case? That is, in the absence of further specific symmetry conditions or constraints on the spectrum of the masses of heavy Majorana neutrinos, except that it is not quasi-degenerate. How low high can be the scale of non-resonant leptogenesis when the requisite CP violation is provided exclusively by the CP violating the Raco Majorana phases in the PMNS matrix. Is leptogenesis compatible with the neutrino option in the general case and in the case of low energy leptonic CP violation? And how the transitions between the different leptogenesis flavor regime occur when the requisite CP violation is due exclusively to the leptonic Dirac Majorana CP phases. So I will discuss, uh, I mean, uh, what we have found. Now, few introductory slides about uh, neutrino mixing in the case in the setting of type 1 CSO that I'm going to use. Uh, first of all, the flavor neutrino states, as you know, uh, will be which participate in the charge current weak interaction. They are linear combination of the states of light Majorana neutrinos multiplied by the PMNS matrix, elements of the PMNS matrix and states of the heavy Majorana neutrinos. However, the, the elements which couple the states of the heavy Majorana neutrinos to the charged leptons in the charged lepton current typically are very small. And pra in practice, the uh, PMNS matrix, uh, which describes the mixing of the light neutrino states, is a 3 by 3 unitary matrix. And in this case, uh, we have uh, genuine three flavor neutrino oscillations, and the flavor neutrino oscillation probabilities are functions of the energy of the neutrinos, the distance traveled by the neutrinos, the elements of the PMNS matrix, and on the two independent difference of neutrino mass squares present in the case of three light uh, uh, neutrino states, delta m squared 2, 1 and delta m squared 3, 1. In, uh, practi in many practical applications, it's convenient to use a specific parameterization of the PMNS matrix, and we have uh, something that is called standard parameterization, which I'm going to use, in which uh, it is expressed in terms of a CKM-like matrix, which contains the Dirac phase, and a diagonal matrix, which contains the two CP violating Majorana phases. Now, the enormous amount of neutrino oscillation data, which was accumulated over many years of uh, studies, allows to determine the neutrino mixing angles, the three neutrino mixing angles in the PMNS matrix, and the two neutrino mass square differences with really rem remarkable precision. Uh, as you know, uh, the neutrino mixing is very different from the quark mixing because it consists of two large mixing angles, theta 1, 2, which is of the order of 34 degrees, two, two, theta 2, 3, which is of the order of 45 degrees, and one small an angle, theta 1, 3, which is of the order of 8 degrees. The two neutrino mass square differences uh, uh, are characterized by a large hierarchy. Delta m squared 2, 1 is uh, roughly by a factor of 30 smaller than the absolute value of the delta m squared 3, 1. Now, the current neutrino oscillation data doesn't allow to determine the sign of the larger of the two neutrino mass square differences. And the two possible signs correspond to two types of neutrino mass spectrum with normal ordering and inverted ordering. And in a standardly used convention, the first corresponds to the lightest neutrino 
being nu1, while the second corresponds to the lightest neutrino being nu3, and I'm going to use it in this analysis. Uh, further, uh, concerning the CP violating phases, the Dirac phase causes can cause CP violation affects neutrino oscillations. That is the difference between the probabilities of new and new prime and anti newell anti newell prime with L different from L prime oscillations. The magnitude of the CP violating effects is controlled by the so-called rephasing invariant associated with the Dirac phase of the PMNS matrix. And in terms of the standard parameterization, it is, it is given by this simple expression. And the only unknown quantity here is delta, the Dirac CP violating phase. In the past, there were some indications that delta can be close to three pi over two. And in that case, the JCP factor in magnitude would be by three orders of magnitude bigger than the JCP factor in the quark sector. It's very difficult to get hold on the Majorana phases. Actually, we have no information about the values of these phases. One of the reasons is that the flavor neutrino oscillation probabilities are not sensitive to these phases. Majorana phases play a very important role in processes which are characteristic for the Majorana nature of the light neutrinos. And uh, however, we are interested in these phases also because of this intriguing and I would say even very appealing uh, possibilities that these phases, the Iraq or Majorana phases, provide the CP violation phases, the CP violation necessary for the generation of the baryon asymmetry of the universe. So the situation concerning the type of neutrino mass spectrum and the values of the Dirac phase is completely unsettled. And therefore, uh, these two parameters, as well, the values of the Majorana phases will be treated in the following as three parameters in the analysis. This is the uh, parameter, the values of the angles and of the two neutrino mass square differences that I'm going to use in the analysis in the case of normal ordering and inverted ordering. Although there is some uh, value of the Dirac phase, this will be treated as a free parameter, as I said. Now, as you know, in leptogenesis, a very important role um, crucial role is played by neutrino Yukawa couplings and by random, but by the Majorana mass term of the right-handed neutrinos, which is written here in the mass basis of uh, the right-handed neutrinos. Now, after the spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, the Majorana mass term for the right-handed neutrinos and the Yukawa couplings produced a mass matrix for the light neutrinos, which in the limit when the non-diagonal elements are much smaller than the diagonal element, give you the standard expression for the light neutrino mass matrix in the type 1 CISO mechanism. Now, however, in the setting we are going to consider the one loop corrections to the light neutrino mass matrix can be large. It is given by this expression. And uh, when one considers the sum of the three level and one loop correction, one has to modify the expressions for the inverse of the uh, right-handed uh, mass matrix uh, uh, in this way. So to take into account uh, these corrections, which I mean the expression which enters in the expression for the light neutrino mass matrix. Correspondingly, one has also to modify the expressions for the Casa Sibara parameterization of the neutrino Yukawa couplings, where here instead of mj to the minus one appears this function f to the minus one, which is given here. Now, for the Carl Sibara R matrix, we are going to use uh, this standard parameterization where the angles one, I mean, uh, contain a real part and imaginary part, all three angles. Now, uh, in high scale leptogenesis based on type 1 CISO, as you all know, the out of equilibrium decays of the heavy Majorana neutrinos in L plus phi minus, where phi is the Higgs, or L minus phi plus, caused by the CP violating Yukawa couplings, proceed with different rates, producing a CP violated asymmetries in the, in the flavor lepton charges and in the total lepton charge. And these are converted into a baryon asymmetry by 
dysphaleron uh, processes. Uh, okay, now the charge lepton final states in the decays of heavy neutrinos, at psi i and psi bar i, are actually a superposition of the charge lepton flavor states, that is the states of the electron, muon, and tau. And uh, well, let's consider for simplicity in this part just the decay of one heavy Majorana neutrino. Now, uh, this coherent, when uh, these states, I mean, we, when the states produced a coherent superposition of the uh, charged lepton flavor states, the flavor states are not distinguishable. However, uh, if the charged lepton Yokawa couplings are in thermal equilibrium, and the processes mediated by them uh, are fast and are faster than the expansion rate of the universe, then in that case, this, the coherence, I mean, this coherence is broken and we are in a decoherent regime. Now, there are which determine the so-called one flavor, two flavor and three flavor regimes of generation of the barium acidity. These decoherent regimes are uh, in terms of temperature of the universe are determined by the rate, by the ratio of the rate of the processes mediated by the charge lepton yukawa couplings and the expansion rate of the universe. And in the case of uh, tau uh, charge lepton yukawa coupling, uh, it becomes important at temperatures below 10 to the 12 GV. In the case of mu yukawa part coupling, I mean, the effects due to it become important at temperature below 10 to the 9 GV. And this also determined the, uh, the regions of one flavor, two flavor, and three flavor leptogenesis. I mean, the one flavor leptogenesis occurs at temperatures much bigger than 10 to the 12 GV. The two flavor leptogenesis in temperatures between 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 9 GV. And the three flavor leptogenesis at temperatures below 10 to the 9 GV. Now, uh, Boltzmann equations are semi-classical time evolution of the number densities of heavy Majorana neutrinos and the B mi minus L charge of the universe. When they are valid, at temperatures uh, much above 10 to the 12 GV, where the charge lepton yukawa couplings are not, the, the interaction mediated by them are not effective, uh, the, the coherence effect that can be produced by these couplings are negligible. And in that case, we are in an unflavored or single flavored regime, and it can be described by the single flavor Boltzmann equation. In the temperature interval between 10 to the 9 and 10 to 12 GV, uh, where the muon and electron charge, the interaction mediated by uh, muon and electron charge lepton Yukawa couplings are much slower than the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, provided the uh, interaction mediated by the tau yuka tau coupling are infinitely fast or sufficiently fast during the whole period of leptogenesis, then we are in the, same, in the case of two-flavored regime, and it can be described by two-flavored Boltzmann equation. And similarly, uh, below 10 to the 9 GV, if the interactions mediated by tau and mu charge lepton yuka couplings are infinitely fast during the whole period of leptogenesis, we are in the regime of three flavor uh, leptogenesis that can be described by three flavor Boltzmann equation. Now, here are uh, the Boltzmann equation in the case of single flavor regime. Uh, that is temperatures much below, much above 10 to the 12 GV. Here is the CP violating asymmetry, the decay uh, parameter and the washout term. But he, the comment I want to make that if one looks at the expression for the CP violating asymmetry, it depends on the Y dagger Y, the product of this, this is where Y is the uh, neutrino Yokawa coupling. And it is all easy to show that this doesn't depend on the PMNS matrix. And therefore, in this regime described by single flavor Boltzmann equation, the CP violation for generation of the barium asymmetry can only come from the Kazo-Sibara matrix. If the Casasibara matrix is CP conserving, the barium, we, don't, we cannot have production of barium asymmetry due to the uh, CP violating phases in the PMNMS matrix in the formalism described by the 
single flavor Boltzmann equation. Okay, now uh, we, we in what uh, I mean in these studies we have used actually the density matrix uh, equations, which are accurate tools to study thermal leptogenesis accounting for quantum decoherence processes, and there as their effects change continuously in time. They are not there. I mean, this, uh, uh, this decoherence effects caused by the charge lepton car couplings are neither infinitely fast nor negligible. So uh, the density matrix equations take into account in a proper way their effects in the generation of the baryon symmetry. These are the equations uh, for the time evolution of the entries of the density matrix of the charge lepton flavor states. The diagonal elements give you the number density of one third D minus uh, L alpha asymmetry. The trace gives the number density of B minus L asymmetry, while the non diagonal elements describe the degree of coherence between the flavor states. This is the set of equations uh, in the case of just uh, uh, one neutrino, one heavy Majorana neutrino, so simplified case. But the point I want to make that this double commutator written here uh, give rise to an exponential damping term proportional to the ratio of the rates caused by the charge lepton yukawa couplings and the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, in this, if these terms are infinitely large, the density matrix is driven towards a diagonal form and the density matrix equations reduced to the three flavor set of the Boltzmann equations. Okay, this is the expression for the CP violating asymmetry in the density matrix equation formalism. And this is expression to the final by, uh, baryon asymmetry in terms of the B minus L number density. Now, first of all, let's look uh, what new, I mean, uh, let's try to answer the question how long, how low, sorry, can be the scale of, uh, of leptogenesis uh, if we assume that uh, the only assumption being that uh, the heavy Majorana neutrinos are not quasi degenerate in mass. We have the Davison Ibarra bound, uh, for which is obtained of 10 to the 9 GV lower bound on the mass of the lightest heavy Majorana neutrino obtained in the case of hierarchical spectrum and without taking flavor effects into account. In this study, we have shown that actually uh, the one can, if with mild hierarchy between the masses of heavy Majorana neutrinos and taking into account also the one look corrections to the light three neutrino mass term, uh, the scale of leptogenesis can be lower to 10 to the 6 GV. So one can have non-resonant uh, flavor leptogenesis at scales as low as 10 to the 6 GV. Below 10 to the 6 GV, uh, the inter in, uh, one has to introduce very strong uh, fine tuning uh, in order to get the light, uh, light neutrino mass matrix. That is a compensation between three level and one local contribution to the light neutrino mass matrix, which becomes, uh, I mean, uh, really ugly. And therefore, we stop at 10 to the 6 GV. Here are the uh, one loop uh, corrections, I mean, the diagrams. Here I again uh, give you the formula, the corresponding expression for the one loop correction. And these are the results of the studies which show that uh, one can reproduce, I mean, the uh, the observed value of the neutrino mixing angles, one gets a prediction of the Dirac and Majorana phases in case. In this case, one gets a prediction for the lightest neutrino mass. And these are the masses of the three heavy Majorana neutrinos uh, for which one can have successful leptogenesis. These are three benchmark points. The upper three rows corresponds to the spectrum, light neutrino mass spectrum with normal ordering. The lower three is inverted ordering. This is uh, the, the last, the one before the last row corresponds to the case when uh, light neutrino mass matrix is only generated by the one loop correction, while the last row corresponds to the case when the, the one loop corrections is negligible. 
Now, uh, how low or high can be the scale of non-resonant leptogenesis in the general case when the requisite CP violation is provided by the CP violating phases Dirac or Moirana of the PMNS matrix? Now, uh, I just summarized the results. For example, uh, one can have su successful leptogenesis uh, in the case of M1 of the order of 10 to the 6 GV. Uh, again, mild hierarchy between uh, the uh, uh, heavy Majorana neutrino masses and uh, CP violation provided either by the Dirac or Majorana phases. Uh, this is shown on this case for the case of somewhat larger value of the lightest neutrino, lightest heavy Majorana neutrino mass of the order of 10 to the 8 GV. And if you look, I mean, the contours correspond to the one sigma and two sigma region for which you have successful leptogenesis in the alpha 2 1, alpha 3 1 place, delta alpha 3 1, and delta, delta alpha 2 1 uh, plane. The upper three uh, plots correspond to the normal ordering, the down plots correspond to the inverted ordering. If you look here, I mean, one can have successful leptogenesis for CP conserving values of the phases alpha 2 1 and alpha 3 1, 180 degrees and 380 degrees in which case all the CP comes from the Dirac phase. And of course, you can have also the possibility when the Dirac phase is CP conserving, but all the CP comes from the Majorana phases. This is a case of uh, M1 of the order of 10 to the 6 GV and lightest neutrino mass of the order of 0 0.05 EV, one and two sigma region. And you see that then in this case, uh, all three CP violating phases contribute. Uh, to the generation of the baryon asymmetry. Now, uh, this is a description of the I, what I just said uh, in a kind of concise form. So let me move on. Of course, I mean, if uh, you have CP violation in the baryon, which generates the baryon asymmetry due to the Iraq phase, then you have a correlation between the Iraq phase, between the baryon asymmetry the value of the baryon asymmetry and JCP factor, which is measured in neutrino oscillation experiment. And this correlation is shown on this figure. The red curve, I mean, the red uh, horizontal curve corresponds to the absurd value of the baryon asymmetry. So you should look at these points. This is just one example. Of course, there are many more uh, where uh, one can have this correlation. Uh, Similarly, I mean, these are, these are, um, uh, this shows the dependence on the baryon asymmetry on the uh, Majorana phase, alpha 2, 1. Majorana phase is alpha 2, 1 and alpha 3, 1. The, uh, you have successful production of the baryon asymmetry at these points for alpha 2, 1 and these points for alpha 3, 1. It is uh, again an example. I mean, there are not much more. The, I want to say that the parameter space for which you have successful leptogenesis is much larger than just these points. Now, let's look at the following. Uh, let's consider how the transitions between three flavor, two flavor, and one flavor regime occur. And this is illustrated uh, uh, on this figure, these four figures. For the cases when there is just one CP violating parameter in the Casa Sibara matrix. This is uh, Y3 indicated here. And uh, this figure, I mean, the figures from left to right and top bottom corresponds to the decrease of the value of this parameter, 30 degrees, 5 degrees, 0, 3 degrees. And here in this last bottom uh, right panel, uh, the CP violation comes from the from the phases in the PMNS matrix. What you see here in in red is uh, the solution of the three flavor Boltzmann equation. In green, uh, the solution uh, of the two flavor Boltzmann equation. This line corresponds the one flavor the, the solution of the one flavor Boltzmann equation. And the blue line corresponds to the solution that one obtains using the density matrix formalism. And you see that, uh, first of all, uh, 
the transition between there is a nice transition between three and two flavor regime described by the uh, by the density matrix uh, formalism and between uh, two flavor and one flavor regime uh, this is seen here however even at all already at this stage some peculiarity arises i mean at the transition between two flavor and one flavor regime the asymmetry goes through zero and then uh, and actually changes sign at about 10 to the 12 gb the picture is completely different in the case uh, in in the region of one flavor regime in the case when all the cp violation comes from the dirac phase as you see the asymmetry grows i mean it goes through zero at 10 to the 12 gb then it grows and reaches a plateau and then it doesn't diminish i mean it goes stays constant for two orders of magnitude so we wanted to understand what happens in this case these are the solutions Maybe you have five I mean, minutes yes these are uh, this gives you the values of the dirac and majorana phases for which you at in the regime of one flavor uh, you have successful leptogenesis uh, described by the density matrix equation uh, in, in the Dirac, in the Boltzmann equation formalism, there shouldn't be, I mean, the, the baryon asymmetry should be zero. So you see that you have a solution uh, in this case, and we wanted to understand what is going on. So this is basically what we found. The two to one flavor uh, transition takes place at 10 to the 12 GV. The baryon asymmetry goes through zero and changes sign in the transition. This happens only in the strong washout regime and with zero initial abundance of the heavy Majorana neutrino. Now, further, we have studied in great detail uh, this uh, problem, I mean, this transition between one, two, and three flavor regime in the, in the si more simple case of only two heavy Majorana neutrinos with hierarchical spectrum. And again, uh, all the CP violation in this study was assumed to come from the Dirac or Majorana CP violating phases. Now, the, co the conclusion of this study are the following. The Boltzmann equation can fail to describe correctly the generation of the baryon asymmetry in the one, two, or three flavor regime. They can as estimate the asymmetry even by a factor of 10. The one to two and two to three flavor transitions can take place at the same value of the heavy, lightest heavy Majorana neutrino mass, with baryon asymmetry going through this, through a relatively shallow minimum at the transition value of n1. The two flavor regime can persist about 10 to the 12 GV and below 10 to the 9 GV. The flavor effects in leptogenesis persist beyond 10 to the 12 GV with the requisite CP violation provided by the Dirac or Majorana phases. At 10 to the 12 GV, the absolute value of baryon asymmetry reaches a plateau where it remains practically constant as M1 increases and flavor effects are fully operative. Uh, we have determined the minimal value of the lightest heavy Majorana neutrino mass and the ranges of the Dirac and Majorana phases for which one can have successful leptogenesis. leptogenesis. For normal ordering spectrum, we have found that the sign of sine delta, which controls the CP violation effects in neutrino oscillation, is correlated with the sign of the baryon asymmetry in the region of successful leptogenesis, with uh, delta lying in the interval between pi and 2 pi, or 0 pi, in the case uh, where the CP conserving Casa-Sibara parameter is real or purely imaginary. For Similar result is obtained for the uh, inverted uh, spectrum with inverted ordering. And uh, I mean, this result actually uh, can be used in order to exclude some of the possi possible ranges of the parameter space uh, for which uh, we have successful leptogenesis. I am not going to go through the details. Let me show you all just some figures which illustrate these points. So here are again the transition between two, three, and one flavor regime in the case when CP violation is due to the 
city violate increases in the PMNS maybe. The, the, for the dashed line, the baryon asymmetry is negative, solid line, it is positive. And you see that uh, you can have uh, the transition between three and two flavor regime, again, with baryon asymmetry going to zero, changing sign, going to zero in the transition region between two and one flavor regime, changing sign again, and then reaching a plateau below 10 to the 12 GB. This case illustrates uh, one of the possibilities where somehow the asymmetry uh, when going through three to two flavor regime goes through a shallow minimum, just one, doesn't change sign, and then uh, proceeds uh, in this way. Again, above 10 to the 12 GV, it reaches a plateau, and it, it has a behavior which is di very different than the behavior described by the two flavor uh, Boltzmann equation or single flavor Boltzmann equation. Uh, I will skip this. I mean, this is the last part, which is uh, de uh, devoted to the following question. Is leptogenesis compatible with the neutrino option? Neutrino option is uh, the case when the parameters in the Higgs potential of the standard model are not introduced uh, by hand, but are generated at one loop by the neutrino Yukawa couplings. And we have considered this case. I mean, this uh, idea was uh, put forward by Brive and Prot in this paper. And we have considered the case whether one can have successful leptogenesis in this particular setting when only the, uh, the quartic Yukawa coupling constant is introduced by hand, while the mass term, the negative mass term, is generated by this diagram, uh, one loop diagram. We have found that uh, indeed one can have successful leptogenesis for normal and inverted neutrino mass orderings uh, in the range of uh, ah the here the uh, one can have successful leptogenesis only with quasi degenerate heavy Majorana neutrinos. The mass, uh, the common mass, has to be in the range between 10 to the six and about 10 to the seven GV. And the mass splitting uh, between the two heavy Majorana neutrinos, the case we have considered, has to be very small, at about 10 to the minus, uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 8. And again, also in this case, the baryon asymmetry can be produced uh, when the CP violation is provided only by the Dirac or Majorana phases in the PMNS matrix. With this, I think I will stop. And these are the conclusion. Thank you very much for the for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. So let's see, uh, time for questions. Uh, OK, so we have a question from Misha. Uh, yeah, so hi, Sergey. I, I have, uh, thank you for your talk. Yeah. yeah, I have actually several questions. So uh, your new result, well, uh, about 10 to the 6 GV. Uh, so do I understand correctly, uh, this is the, the lower limit on the mass of, uh, of right-handed neutrino. Right. So it's not coming from leptogenesis. <clears throat> you no. say it's coming from uh, uh, fine tuning. Right. Uh, and uh, if I forget about fine tuning, what is your feeling? How far can you go down? Uh, Amisha, we, unfortunately, we stopped there because we were discouraged by, I mean, you need a fine tuning of the order of 10 to the 3. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one part in, in 1,000. And yeah. uh, we didn't go further down uh, to exploit, uh, I mean, how far you can go. But it's not excluded that you can connect to, I mean, to TV scale, probably. Oh, of course, then the fine tuning will become larger and larger, at certain point, it will begin to decrease because the contribution from the one loop correction will begin to decrease. Mm -hmm. So we didn't exploit this. It, probably it's worth exploiting. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, second question, if I'm allowed. Yes. Uh, so can you say more about your motivation to consider the case when you only have uh, low energy CP violation? and uh, the extra phases are, uh, so to say, thrown away. Well, uh, we wanted to see whether uh, uh, 
one can have a handle on this case. Uh, uh, for example, let me show you something that perhaps uh, will have to explain. First of all, I like very much the idea uh, of CP violation in leptogenesis provided by phases in the PMNS matrix because uh, after all, I mean, the Dirac phase can be measured. Uh, uh, for Majorana phases, we don't know, but there is a hope that in the future, when, <coughs> for example, if neutrinos are Majorana particles at one stage, even some information about the Majorana phases will be available. Now, uh, this, of course, this is a case of only two heavy Majorana neutrinos with hierarchical spectrum. What we like very much is that in this case, we find a correlation between sine delta, the sine of sine delta, and the sine of the baryon asymmetry. And for example, uh, uh, in the case of normal ordering, uh, depending on whether the CP conserving Casasibara parameter is real or purely imaginary, uh, delta has to lie either between pi and 2 pi or between 0 and 2 pi. In the case of inverted ordering, uh, I mean, this correlation is for delta uh, lying between pi and 2 pi. Now, suppose you measure, you, you find out that the spectrum is, is inverted ordering, and then the delta lies between pi and uh, between 0 and pi. Then you exclude uh, the generation of baryon asymmetry in this setting uh, uh, due to the CP violate due to the CP violating phase, uh, due to the Dirac CP violating phase. Uh, uh, so uh, there is some handle on the parameter space. There is more to it because also the, the ranges of values of the heavy Majorana neutrinos for which you can have successful leptogenesis depend on whether uh, the uh, CP violation comes from the Dirac or Majorana phases. And uh, uh, this type of correlation somehow reduce, uh, if you measure delta with high precision, this, they can reduce significantly the available parameter space. In some sense, you have a probe, indirect probe of, uh, of this setting. So for some, somehow this seems appealing to me. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Val Valeri? Yeah, let me continue with the same question, with the last question. <coughs> is there model, I mean, is there a, a basis independent difference between the Dirac phase and phases in the, uh, in the uh, you know, mixing matrix of, uh, of uh, heavy neutrinos? I mean, Basis in can you can you can you you know uh, can you quantify what you mean what do you mean by saying that there is just Dirac phase? Is it not a uh, basis dependent statement? Uh, no. Look, I mean, you uh, you can do all this using uh, invariance, which we did not do. But I think that. Uh, 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 for example, you can associate the Iraq phase with a uh, well-known uh, JCP factor, Yaltskop invariant. There are similar invariants for the Majorana phases. So no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, Sergei, let me just pose the question differently. Suppose you have all kinds of phases, right, in, in the entire neutrino sector, including the, uh, the, neutral, uh, the, the heavy neutral, uh, fermions, I mean, including the uh, uh, sterile yeah. fermions. Okay, yeah. you introduce everything there. Right. Then you get some Dirac phase, after all, right, in the in the uh, PMNS matrix, which is a combination of all phases that you have there. Right. What do you mean by saying that you have just one Dirac phase and nothing else? Uh, okay. If I understand correctly, let me go from the, uh, uh, let me try to, to explain. Uh, it boils down uh, to the fact that uh, 
I mean, uh, in the the left-handed flavor neutrino states, if I understand your question correctly, is a combination of uh, states of the light Majorana neutrinos and heavy Majorana neutrinos. Now, uh, uh, when these elements, which couple the heavy Majorana neutrinos to the charge leptons in the weak charge lepton current are extremely small, and which is the, which is the case practically uh, for all these uh, analyses, that we have considered, then you can forget about this coupling. And therefore, the uh, PMMS matrix in some way decouples from the matrix which describes the mixing of the heavy Majorana neutrinos. No, 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 no. I have a different, the question was different, Sergey. Sorry. Okay. We can maybe talk a lot later on. But my question is suppose you do the entire, you know, complete neutrino sector, including. Uh, including um, uh, sterile neutrinos, right? Then there you, you have plenty of phases in general. Yeah. Right? Right. And uh, the Dirac phase is a certain combination of all these phases. No, this I don't under this statement I don't understand. Okay. I think the Dirac phase is an independent parameter. I think this is an yeah, extremely interesting question, but we can open breakout rooms uh, after after morning talks. Yeah, I will, I will be also interested to, to hear. But uh, also, did we have a comment? Uh, Bjorn, did you want to make a comment or question? Yeah, um, kind of uh, both. So concerning the flavor dynamics of the charged leptons, so yes. there's one effect that if we like say you have a flavor correlation in charged leptons mm -hmm. and then gauge interactions will mediate uh, pair creation pair annihilation processes and then in the density matrix for the anti-leptons this will lead to um, a complex conjugate uh, correlation in the off-diagonal elements okay and then at the same time uh, one has the direct flavor oscillations coming from the commutator term with the um, thermal masses essentially of the um, uh, of the uh, charged leptons which cause flavor oscillations and these flavor oscillations uh, have opposite frequencies so we have competing effects namely that the flavors of leptons and antileptons like to oscillate in uh, at opposite angles whereas the gauge interactions try to keep them aligned and yeah, okay, one can, of course, like plug this all into these equations and either solve them numerically or make some uh, analytic estimate. And with an analytic estimate, you look at the eigenvalues of these equations and then you find that um, there are basically, there's an overdamped regime. So these oscillations uh, never really happen, but they're always frustrated by these gauge interactions. So I am wondering um, whether this has been, you've accounted for this in the analysis and it might be interesting maybe to do so in order to see uh, whether these uh, uh, statements concerning the persistence of flavor effects at high temperatures uh, remain valid also in light of uh, these effects. Now, uh, in this, in the numerical analysis, uh, we use the Ulysses Python package, which was released and made public in uh, 2020, I mean, in, in, in uh, July of uh, 2020. And uh, uh, two of my collaborators uh, uh, collaborated in creating this package uh, for solving uh, the uh, density matrix equations. I think that this affects, uh, I have to check uh, to tell you the truth, but I think that these effects are included in the package. Uh, and uh, uh, all these results that I showed you are obtained by solving uh, uh, this uh, I mean, system of equations with uh, 11, typically with, it's a 11 parameter uh, in the case of three heavy uh, Majorana neutrinos. Uh, one has one have to work with 11 parameters and, and so on. So as far as I know, uh, it, it is a complete uh, package. Now, I have to discuss with, uh, with Granelli Moffat and also with Turner uh, 
uh, whether indeed this oscillation effects are taken into account, but I would be surprised if they're not. So yeah, I mean, I can also like send them a message and check with them whether this is... It would be very interesting yeah. if you do an independent check of uh, all this, if, if you have the capability of doing it. Because, I mean, this behavior is very, very, very strange, uh, really. I mean, this uh, going through zero and riding, and then uh, this plateau above to the 12 GV. But remember, uh, the going through zero, uh, I mean, all these effects are related to uh, the case when uh, the washout is strong and uh, the initial density of heavy Majorana neutrinos is zero. Only in that case, it appears. This plateau, sorry. Uh, and of course, you have to assume, uh, uh, although the going through zero doesn't depend on whether you assume CP violation due to the phases in the PM and ice matrix or not, the plateau appears only in the case when uh, the CP violation is due to the uh, phases in the PM and S matrix. Mm -hmm. However, the going through zero or uh, this shallow uh, minimum mm -hmm. that I showed you here, I mean, these are still very going through zero, changing the sign of the symmetry, and then all the shallow minimum uh, in the transition between three flavor and two flavor regime. Uh, I think they, these are all very interesting features that uh, it, it would be very interesting to have an independent study of these features. Uh, so so we, we have two more questions. Ah, okay, one more question. But maybe let, let's try to keep it rather short because we, we're we running into our lunch time. So, so Kima, uh, please. Lucky, this is not a question, this is a comment. I actually, thanks Sergey, by the way, for, for the talk, but I, I actually would be surprised if this package contains any of the effects that, that, that Bjorn was mentioning, and particularly this particle antiparticle <clears throat> coherences. Uh, to my understanding, they rather don't even contain all the flavor coherences at the fundamental level, but maybe, isn't it rather a Boltzmann level package? No, no, it's Maybe not somebody a package. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a density matrix equation package. I think they added density matrix equation. But uh, we can discuss this uh, sure. maybe after after the talks. Okay, so uh, let's thank uh, Sergey again. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, you very much, much for the questions. Very and, uh, indeed, I mean, we, I would be happy to discuss and uh, it would be very nice if somebody looks into these uh, results and in the way of either ch checking them, either confirming them or tell us what was wrong. Yes. So, so our next speaker is uh, Bjorn. Uh, Sergey, maybe if you can stop share. All right. Uh, how I can do that? Stop sharing. Let me see. Okay. I think I just stopped you. I hope. Okay. Is can, what do you see? Do you just see my talk here? Uh, is it your, yours already? Uh, uh, this, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's okay. yours. Yeah. So our next speaker is uh, Bjorn Garbrecht, and he will be uh, talking about resonant uh, leptogenesis. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for organizing this indeed very interesting workshop with these many nice talks and great discussions. Um, so here's the outline of my talk. Uh, so first I will make some general remarks about baryogenesis and then um, talk about how leptogenesis addresses these requirements for baryogenesis, in particular the key questions of the role played by the deviation from equilibrium and by charge parity violation. Then I will argue that this calls for using non-equilibrium methods for leptogenesis um, in order to corroborate um, and go beyond what is done um, to a large extent successfully by Boltzmann equations, but there are, of course, some important aspects that are not really covered by it. And then I will go to um, the question of resonant leptogenesis, and in particular, um, what I'm trying to get at is, of course, the question is what happens in the very resonant regime when um, the mass splitting is of order of the width of the individual sterile neutrinos or even way below that, because there are 
there have been some incoherent results in the literature. And my take on this is that this is resolved now. Um, I don't know whether any of the other authors are around there, so I'm not trying to be unfair, but I'm at least trying to explain how I come to these conclusions. So, yeah, so particle physics, uh, one of the hallmark and most profound and first things about uh, quantum field theory is that uh, besides matter, there is also antimatter. And this creates the problem of the matter antimatter asymmetry. But it has also been pointed out by Zakharov that uh, particle physics and QFT already hold the key to solving this. And in particular, um, uh, yeah, uh, 1964, so this was 1966, charge parity violation was observed in the Kaon system. So um, it was realized that this can be uh, the, the key, key ingredient to creating a matter antimatter asymmetry. And also what has been quite visionary is to realize that by the CPT theorem that we need also to have a deviation from thermodynamic equilibrium. And also the baryon number has of course to be violated in some way. So these are these three famous Zakharov conditions. What's also interesting to see is that in this paper, um, he already made the right estimate of how big the asymmetry should be. And this was also doable in the 60s because one knew the Hubble rate and therefore one knew the energy density of the universe. And um, if you also know the temperature of the CMB, which was discovered a couple of years before and predicted 20 years before that by alpha, beta, gamma, then you come up with uh, this estimate, which is a bit too high because here you have not accounted for the fact that the universe is uh, mainly, mainly uh, the energy constant is mainly dark matter and dark energy. But uh, the goal was already set uh, more than 50 years ago. We need to explain an asymmetry of uh, 10 to the minus 10. And of course, nowadays, uh, this asymmetry can be um, determined to astonishing accuracy from the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background. And it's uh, yeah, very easy to see from this diagram that the precision that is achieved in this measurement is at the few percent level. Um, because here, um, I just vary the um, value of the baryon asymmetry, um, the baryon to photon ratio here uh, by 10%. And then you see that in particular in the region of the first peak, um, you don't fit the data anymore um, unless you are close to the observed value. And another um, amazing thing about this, and this is perhaps one of the biggest successes of um, applying particle physics to cosmology is that this is consistent with Big Bang nucleosynthesis and the generation of light elements. And somehow this is what uh, everybody is striving for to repeat because um, uh, particle physics or nuclear physics successfully predicts the uh, uh, origin of the light nuclei and quantum physics also predicts how by this uh, spectrum looks the way it looks like. And of course the dream is that one day we might also be um, able to predict in the same fashion um, how much dark matter we have and how much uh, baryons over enter baryons we have in the universe even though we don't really have, uh, we, we, we don't know the fundamental mechanism be, uh, that is uh, below baryogenesis and dark matter. Okay, so I guess in the 60s and 70s, people were hoping that uh, the solution to this problem is around the corner. And indeed in the standard model, um, one has all the necessary ingredients in principle to address the Zakharov conditions. Baryon number is violated uh, because of uh, the baryon plus lepton, lepton number being anomalous. And indeed, there are gauge theory processes that violate this asymmetry and um, violate then the fermion number in B plus L. And it has been pointed out that this is of pivotal importance for understanding the matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Uh, CP violation, as I said, was already observed in 1964, and it has been understood what the mechanism is. It's in the CKM matrix. And then um, there is a, naturally a deviation from equilibrium due to the expansion of the universe. So this doesn't look bad in first place, but then you look at it quantitatively. Um, so you build a rephasing invariant out of uh, the uh, quark masses from which you can get the CKM matrix. Um, it is a dimensionful quantity, which depends here on the quark masses and this dimensionless factor J, which we 
uh, have seen also in Sergei's talk for the PMNS matrix. J in the quark sector is smaller than it might be in the, uh, in the lepton sector. Uh, but what is really the killer here is that if you normalize this to the electro weak scale, so let's say 100 GeV, where things might be happening, then this is tiny. And so you can also view this if you don't like to normalize it to the electro weak scale, that this is really suppressed by the smallness of the second generation Hukawa couplings of the quarks. And then the deviation from equilibrium, well, all the particles we know in the standard model are gauged. So if we characterize the deviation from equilibrium as the ratio of the Hubble rate over the um, interaction rates of these particles, and we say that this ought to be la much larger than one to have a substantial deviation from equilibrium, we arrive at the conclusion that, um, that the temperature has to be very high for this ratio to be much larger than one. So G is a generic gauge coupling which you uh, run by the renormalization group up to the scale of interest. Of course, there's a famous loophole. There might be a first order phase transition. And in fact, in the standard model, there's a first order phase transition if the Higgs mass were below 70 GeV. Of course, this is ruled out. So uh, um, uh, quantitatively, uh, the CP condition and the non-equilibrium condition are not met. And this uh, motivates uh, physics beyond the standard model. So how does leptogenesis address this? So if uh, people hadn't written thousands of papers about this and we had like an entirely fresh look at this, how to realize the uh, Sakharov conditions by extending the standard model, then we would like to add a new particle, which is a gauge singlet. So we can circumvent this problem that it has a gauge coupling and it's kept close to equilibrium at all times. Um, and then maybe we also wanted to couple to standard model fermions at the renormalizable level because uh, maybe non-renormalizable interactions are too speculative. And we want to couple it to fermions because baryons are made up of quarks. Um, and by the anomaly, of course, there's the door to, to leptons. And then we conclude that the only singlet operator in the standard model that involves fermions and is of dimension smaller than four is, of course, the lepton Higgs coupling. So when we couple a new particle to this operator, um, this automatically is a sterile neutrino, N. So N in my notation is the sterile neutrino, not the charged one. So don't get confused with the notation of uh, Sergei's talk as compared to my talk here. And then um, the, the coupling proceeds here via a Yukawa coupling. So here, sorry, I'm using different notation here for the Higgs field. So phi and H, here is the... Um, uh, active neutrino, um, the small nu, and the Yukawa coupling, given that the Higgs field acquires a vacuum expectation value, gives rise to a Dirac mass. So in addition, since the neutrino is a singlet, it generally, generically also has a Majorana mass M. So we have a mixing mass matrix. So these are two component chiral fermions here, or you could also write it in four component formalism, but in principle, these are just chiral degrees of freedom of active leptons um, and sterile uh, neutrinos, of active neutrinos and sterile neutrinos. And we have this mass matrix. And if, as it is assumed in the seesaw, this Majorana mass is much above the Dirac mass, then, um, okay, we can always calculate these eigenvalues. But if the seesaw relation holds, we have one eigenvalue of a state which is mostly like the sterile neutrino of mass M and another eigenstate, which is mostly like the active neutrino. And uh, this is given by this famous seesaw relation here. Okay. And this will be of, important for, of importance for understanding the deviation, the detour from equilibrium and leptogenesis, the seesaw relation. Now, how do we make uh, predictions for baryogenesis and uh, leptogenesis? Let me just check it. Okay, I don't see anything. Okay, I hope it's okay. Um, so in principle, ideally, we would like to solve the full thing. And uh, at first principles in classical physics, we would have Liu will equations where particles are interacting by interaction potentials. And in quantum field theory, the pendant uh, are Schwinger-Dyson equations. These are microscopic kinetic equations and uh, the quantities they evolve are the full correlation functions, all correlation functions in the theory. 
So if you have a macroscopically large number of particles, you uh, will have to evolve correlators of this macroscopic numbers of particles. And this is, of course, um, nothing one can remotely do in practice. So the next thing is then one uh, does this, if you wish, this BBKY um, hierarchy expansion, and one reduces these big correlation functions to just distribution functions. And then one arrives at Boltzmann equations. So Boltzmann equations live on distribution functions. And in making these reductions, one already breaks the um, uh, uh, re reversibility of the um, of the evolution. So this is of course of importance for um, non-equilibrium because at the microscopic level the equations are reversible. But um, if you look at it from a thermodynamic perspective, you have irreversibility already at the point when you work with Boltzmann equations. And then, um, typically, as it applies for high-scale leptogenesis, one would like to further simplify things because Boltzmann equations still have an infinite number of degrees of freedom in the distribution functions. And by taking moments of the Boltzmann equations, that is integrals over momentum space, we arrive at fluid equations, which are uh, formulated in terms of number densities for standard calculations of leptogenesis and dark matter genesis. And in, when you predict the cosmic microwave background, you deal with and isotropies, you may also have bulk flows at higher order in the moment expansion. Okay, now an important characterization of what is going on is uh, a strong weak washout and sometimes also people talk about freeze in and freeze out. So in these fluid equations, we evolve the number densities, which I write here as N, and typically one formulates a quantity that is conserved as the universe expands. And this is the so-called yield, which is the number density to entropy density ratio, N over S. Okay, so here I plot this for the yield of the sterile neutrino and um, like a useful time scale is just the inverse temperature. And then an important characteristic point in this evolution is when the sterile neutrino becomes non-relativistic as the universe cools down. And there are two like principal situations. So let's say we start here with a vanishing initial condition of the sterile neutrino. Of course, it doesn't have to be this way. It could be any initial condition for all we know. But for definiteness, it look like, like a vanishing initial condition. And then if the sterile neutrino equilibrates comparably fast, it could equilibrate before it becomes non-relativistic. And then um, what is plotted here in green is the equilibrium yield. So if the uh, sterile neutrino would follow equilibrium infinitely fast, but after all the um, interactions are finite. And so what is happening is that there's a li little bit of an overshoot. Um, so since the interactions of the sterile neutrino are fast and it violates lepton number, so stuff that is happening here when the evolution the deviation from thermal equilibrium is large typically gets strongly washed out. Okay, there may be loopholes to this in more detailed scenarios. Um, I mean, there were some indications in Sergei's talk about that um, stuff that is happening here would survive over there. But in the standard picture, um, um, basically, since the interactions are fast in strong washout, everything gets forgotten what is happening over here, and only what is happening here in the very tail of, uh, of the approach uh, of the Maxwell suppression um, survives at the end of the day. And this is what we call freeze out because at some point we have Maxwell suppression and then these lepton number violating interactions get effectively shut off. Um, and this is the typical when we have high scale leptogenesis of uh, sterile neutrinos uh, way above the electro weak scale. If a sterile neutrino mass is way below the electro weak scale, we could have a freeze in because then the sphalerons gets quenched by the electro weak phase transition. And then basically there's just a snapshot taken of the isometry that is generated at this stage. Conversely, if we have weak washout, then the sterile neutrino is not um, uh, reaching thermal equilibrium prior to um, uh, it becoming non-relativistic. And you may have the impression that you have can mine here um, a huge amount of um, deviation from equilibrium in order to uh, make baryogenesis happen. But you have to mind the fact that the asymmetry created in inverse decays while you produce the sterile neutrinos gets canceled by what is happening in decays. And so again, to have a net effect, you still need to have washout here. And uh, of course, the washout here is weak. So still, um, you're fighting against the, um, um, you're fighting against uh, 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 
that uh, it, you, yeah, so, so, so you, you basically um, have to work. So you're relying still on washout, even so washout is weak in order to have a net asymmetry because you have this cancellations between inverse decays and decays here. Now, the sweet spot therefore seems to be when we are right between strong washout and weak washout. And this we can characterize by this washout strength K, which is this equilibration rate of the sterile neutrino over the Hubble rate. So if K is evaluated at the temperature when the sterile neutrino becomes non-relativistic. And so this is precisely what's happening here. So the thing goes into equilibrium when the sterile neutrino becomes non-relativistic. So this is the sweet spot. You get the maximum asymmetry. And when K is much greater than one, we talk about strong washout. When K is much less than one, we talk about weak washout. Okay, so how do we make leptogenesis with this? So we have seen these equations in the previous talk already. Simplest way to do this is we have fluid equations for the sterile neutrinos, which essentially give us the deviation from equilibrium. So if we solve this equation, we basically solve for this quantity and this couples to the decay asymmetry um, epsilon, which is defined in the decay rate into leptons minus antileptons divided normalized by the full thing. Okay, and then there's also a washout rate, which with negative sign likes to relax the leptons to zero. And here you see that in this non-relativistic approximation, it suffers Maxwell suppression, which causes then the freeze out if the temperature uh, becomes very small. So as I said, the best compromise between large uh, lepton number violation, um, which we would here, so we want gamma to be large, but on the other hand, we don't want it to be too large because it also enters the washout is precisely when K is one. Um, and this means uh, gamma is of order H when T is of order M. And then um, the decay rate is given here by the decay rate of a massive um, uh, fermion into another massless fermion and to, into a mass, massive boson. Uh, so this is gamma, and this is the Hubble rate from the Friedman equation um, in radiation-dominated universe. Okay, and here if we replace the, the uh, if we set the temperature to be equal to the mass, we have this relation here, and then we use the seesaw relation for the um, mass of the light neutrinos, because what we realize here is that when we um, when we, uh, so what are we doing here? When we are dividing here by M and, um, um, and multiply this equation by V square, uh, we can eliminate basically the mass scale from this equation here. And this is very interesting because we eliminate the mass scale of the sterile neutrino in favor of the scale of the light neutrino, but the light neutrino mass is something that we can hopefully uh, figure out at some point, maybe during our lifetimes by measurements from cosmology, or at least we can constrain it. Now to hit the sweet spot, we would predict a, a light neutrino mass scale of 0.1 milli electron volt. And of course the typical scale in the mass differences is around uh, maybe 10, 50 milli electron volt. Um, and if this also applies for the lightest neutrino mass, this would point to the fact that we are in the strong washout regime, but not very deep in the strong washout regime. So the, the rage about leptogenesis at the end of the 90s was that with the discovery of these light neutrino masses, um, it was essentially found that one is in the sweet spot or close to the sweet spot for leptogenesis. But alas, this does not give us any information after this elimination of the mass scale, of the overall mass scale. Okay, uh, so let's skip this for saving time. And let's go right to the question of um, so we have talked about non-equilibrium, so what about CP violation? And let's recall here, and this will be of importance to relate it to resonant leptogenesis, um, the standard picture about CP violating processes. So what is here in the uh, absolute value square is supposed to be an amplitude. Um, and let's say we have two uh, uh, contributions to this amplitude that are mediated by certain coupling constants, A and B. Um, then there's a, um, an absolute value from, um, from such an amplitude, from such a matrix element. And then there are additional phases. So A and B, they can be complex because they're coupling constants. And then there are extra phases here, which are the so-called strong phases. So the weak phases are CP odd because we know that when we apply a charge conjugation to a certain operator in our Lagrangian, 
uh, we have to complex conjugate these CP phases. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, strong phases that can come from uh, quantum correlations and they are CP even. Now let's look at this process and square it. And then we have a cross term between the first and the second. We get something like this. And then when we look at the CP conjugate process, uh, we have another cross term. And the crucial thing is now that the weak phases get uh, CP conjugated, um, whereas the, uh, the strong phases or the CP even phases remain as they are. And so if you take the difference between these two processes, um, you see that you get a non-vanishing um, remainder here. Yeah. Okay, so far I have been like completely agnostic about where these phases are coming from. Um, but of course, this will be like a key point in what is going to follow. Indeed, uh, in fact, these uh, strong phases or the CP even phases are coming from um, quantum coherences. And often they correspond to on-shell cuts in Feynman diagrams, but they could also be uh, coming from mixing and oscillations, namely these off-diagonal elements in these mixing matrices for flavor oscillations. And these flavor oscillations, um, of course, they do not only happen as we had in the previous talk for the, um, uh, for the active uh, leptons, but they also happen crucially for the sterile neutrinos. And as I will argue, there are in fact parametric regimes where both pictures overlap. So this mixing and oscillation picture does not like apply to all diagrams, but for these so-called wave function diagrams, um, you can always describe these by mixing and oscillations and only in certain parametric reg regions by on-shell cuts. So that will be the main key to understanding what's going on in resonant leptogenesis. Okay, but let's stay in the picture of the on-shell cuts. Then we have these two famous contributions uh, a, a vertex contribution and a wave function contribution. And uh, so what is maybe interesting if you look at this is that here uh, we have an interference from a process where a, a lepton is directly generated with processes where first you go via an anti-lepton. So in the qu quantum mechanical sense, uh, this the matter-antimatter asymmetry is really a hallmark quantum effect because it interferes history where a certain particle has been always a particle, but then with histories where it has been an antiparticle at the same time. So what we see in the macroscopic world in this picture, um, which in some sense is probably paradigmatically at least correct, um, is like at a, at a profound level a quantum effect. Now, if we calculate the CP asymmetries that are coming from these diagrams, we are getting this famous wave function and vertex contributions. And then in the wave function contribution, we see that we have here a propagator of another sterile neutrino. Um, so here the external momentum is um, mi square. And here we get a resonance if these masses are very close together. And of course, this uh, wave function contribution cannot be correct if we are in the completely degenerate regime, because then we have a divergence. Um, but by definition, of course, the decay asymmetry must be smaller than one. Um, now, as we have also discussed in the previous talk, if we like, um, do not play shenanigans here and um, don't allow for resonant enhancement, then um, there has, is this davidson barra bound, which uh, probably is like superseded um, in substantial way by, um, by, or can be superseded to some extent by flavor effects. But still, what you see here, you have a fourth order here in Yukawa couplings. And here a second order. So basically the CP asymmetry gets suppressed by a second order of Yukawa couplings. And if you have smaller Yukawa couplings, um, you also have a smaller mass scale of the sterile neutrino. So this is basically what is creating this lower bound. So from the perspective of deviation from equilibrium, nothing is telling you what the mass scale is, but here standard leptogenesis has a preference in order to create a larger CP asymmetry for higher masses. Uh, and here you have five minutes. Oh, I have only five minutes left, okay. Um, so uh, let's then um, ask the question why we go for uh, non-equilibrium methods here. So if you look at this interference of tree and loop amplitudes, then you see that um, we have uh, uh, these cut diagrams in order to get these strong CP even phases. And this raises the question, is this an extra process or is it already accounted for in the Boltzmann equations by an interference of uh, these three uh, three-level processes. 
And indeed, if you include only um, these diagrams, you create an asymmetry already in equilibrium, which is as odd with the CPT theory. And you can simply argue for this by applying the CPT conjugation to a certain process. And then if you multiply these rates here, you get the rates for going from anti-leptons into leptons, which would be one plus two epsilon, as opposed to the opposite rate um, um, from going to leptons to anti-leptons. And this, of course, can't be the case. And an ad hoc fix in leptogenesis calculations is to subtract the real intermediate states. Now, of course, this is not a very uh, satisfactory solution. And the better way out is really to compute the real time evolution of the full thing. There are also emerged in the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, or 15 years or so, um, uh, other reasons why going beyond this um, Boltzmann equations, because essentially um, one does not always have asymptotic states in the S matrix that would accurately describe what is going on in the early universe. So there's certain thermal processes here. And so we need a real time evolution of the density operator, which can be used and done in time dependent perturbation theory, but time dependent perturbation theory in particle theory is difficult to organize unless one has a neat formalism, such as Feynman diagrams. And if you want to do it in real time, there's the so-called schwinger keldish closed time path formalism. So, I mean, I would like to explain this in a bit more detail, um, but the idea is, okay, let's try. We start with an initial state here at phi plus, we evolve up to a time tau, and then we evolve back to a time um, to, to, to phi minus. And then we can also weight this by a density matrix, and since this is all made up by amplitudes, there's a path integral representation for it. And then since there's a path integral representation, we can calculate correlation functions from taking derivatives of this generating functional. Um, so we get these two point functions and to relate it to something that looks like Boltzmann equations, we carry out the Wigner transform of the two point function with respect to the relative coordinate here. Um, and this relative coordinate gets traded for a momentum. So this is sort of the macroscopic um, momentum variable of the two-point function. X is the average coordinate, which describes the macroscopic evolution. Um, so there are different causal propagators here. Um, and one can expand this in terms of three-level propagators. One recovers the Feynman propagators. And then one at three level also one recovers the statistical information on the system given in certain distribution functions here. We have assumed here as it is pertinent to leptogenesis spatial homogeneity. Then one sets up Schwinger Dyson equations in this calculus, and a particular linear combination in terms of these plus minus indices are the celebrated Cardanov Beim equations, but they are not the full story because we also need at the same time to solve uh, the pole mass equations, which are given in terms of the retarded and advanced propagators. Of course, other people might prefer to use a different basis here. But anyway, in the cardinal of bind equations, we get information here about the time evolution of the full thing. So for leptogenesis, you can, it has emerged that this can be reduced to the following picture. And since these are Schwinger Dyson equations, they're in first place formulated in terms of the full propagators here. So here we have an equation for the lepton asymmetry, and here we have our equation for the sterile neutrino. And the double line indicates here they are full propagators. And now you can say, okay, I want to have some approximation. I can't solve for the full propagators. So let me expand everything in terms of these three-level propagators that I have written down here. And then you emerge at these diagrams. So note that diagrammatically in the full approximation, this two-loop diagram here with the wave function does not appear um, in the Schwinger Dyson equation. It only appears when you expand it in terms of three-level propagators. And then what you realize in this um, uh, schwinger keldish calculus that you have the cuts that are interferences between two scattering diagrams, um, but you also have the contributions between interferences between the loop and the tree-level diagrams. And getting this all together precisely cancels your um, uh, unwanted CP asymmetry in thermal equilibrium. So this is, a, I think, a very nice uh, way to demonstrate why this schwinger keldish formalism is useful. Now let's apply this finally to resonant leptogenesis. So yeah, it's, it's been 30 minutes, but yeah. Okay, um, I'll be done in three minutes here to just like present the main idea of what the problem is. So we, here we have resonant leptogenesis and we have a regulator here, um, which would correspond to the width of the sterile neutrino. And the problem is in the literature, there are many different R's floating around. 
and um, um, yeah, so, so uh, what it turns out is that this R here depends on the dynamics of the system. And if you're on strong washout leptogenesis, this is the regulator that should be used. And so what is the rationale behind it? We go back to these full equations here. And then instead of expanding this thing here in terms of trio level propagators, we are just having the Schwinger Dyson equation take care of calculating the correlations of the sterile neutrino. And remember that the correlations of the sterile neutrino are what supplies these strong CP even phases here to the problem. And this is nothing but an equation that you could also think of as a, as a density matrix equation, where you have the flavor oscillations among the sterile neutrinos here in the game. So these equations have been um, introduced um, first or used first in the, the context of AIS leptogenesis, but they can just as well be applied to high scale resonant leptogenesis. And so what you see here is that for these off diagonal uh, correlations, this commutator term here, there's no problem, there's no singularity if you take mi equals to mj here now. In fact, the asymmetry will go to zero in this limit. And nonetheless, if for some reason, um, if you have strong washout or if you have strong couplings, you can neglect this derivative term here. You can basically um, cross this out and then your differential equation becomes an ordinary uh, algebraic equation. You can just solve for delta f and then you can put this delta f back into the decay asymmetry. And this is precisely how you come up with this regulator. And here I have compared this for the effective decay asymmetry and for the asymmetries in the particular flavors here. The blue line is the full solution of these density matrix um, equations and the red dashed, li red dashed line is what is happening if you use the regulator. And at initial times when these off diagonal correlations have to build up, uh, well, there's a deviation, but since this is strong washout, uh, the system forgets about um, doing poorly at initial, initial times and then asymptotically you just get the right asymmetry. So uh, this is my almost my last slide here. Um, so here's the recipe. Um, if the mass splitting is larger than the width, then you can just use the standard wave function correction. Um, otherwise, um, if all eigenvalues in the ordinary differential equations are much greater than the Hubble rate, well, you can just use this regulator here. And also if this doesn't apply, well, you just solve the ordinary differential equation for the oscillations of the sterile neutrinos. And since this is the same thing as including this diagram here, um, do not overcount the wave function correction and the oscillations because then you get the result by a factor of two too large as it's sometimes done in the literature. Um, so since this looks somewhat similar to AIS leptogenesis, there's a connection here, which has been also like explored in a very nice work, um, interesting work also by um, these authors here, uh, one of which is pressing me to, now to finish the talk. Um, and yeah, so I, I spare you the conclusions since I'm over time, but um, maybe like a provocative thing here to say is, uh, and maybe it prompts some, um, uh, from some opposition or contradiction is that I think using these non-equilibrium methods um, in the past 20 years, leptogenesis can now be calculated for all parametric configurations, including resonant leptogenesis and quite a few more details as we have heard also today, flavor effects, spectator effects, we can also do weak washout now and also work has been done to see how this works across the electroweak phase transition in particular also in a paper like that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this nice talk. Uh, let's see if we have questions. Uh, yes. Ah, it's, uh, yes. So, so, so while well, pe people are thinking, uh, I have a brief question uh, myself. Uh, so basically, Ah, okay, okay. Well, let me finish the question. So basically, uh, what we what we do in this um, kind of quantum Boltzmann equations is is the right thing. The the, the take home message uh, from the last part is that you don't need to resound this you cover couplings. Uh, is this correct? Yeah. Okay. I mean, sometimes uh, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, some of these papers on resonant leptogenesis have had this picture of um, um, 
of in introducing these resumptive Kaba couplings for, I mean, works for both the vertex, but also for the wave function diagram. But um, the key message here is that if you solve these oscillation equations, so the Schwinger Dyson equations yes. just look like this. And so you don't have an explicit two loop diagram at this level. And this, the reason for this is that the Schwinger Dyson equations descend from the two particle irreducible effective action. Um, and um, if you take the two particle irreducible effective action and you take the variation with respect to the lepton propagator, the red propagator, you simply do not get a, a, a two loop diagram here because that would be two particle reducible. And, I see, I see. Yeah, and so the, the resummation, if there's any summation done, it is basically taken care by, by this equation here. And in fact, if you, um, if you solve this equation here algebraically, then you see that you get a structure, um, you, you get precisely the structure that you anticipate for the propagator because here you have the mass difference if you divide by this factor and then these extra terms here give you the regulator. Yeah? But of course, if this algebraic mm -hmm. approach doesn't apply, then you still have to account for the derivative term here and you get the right answer. Okay, this is, yeah, this is very reassuring for, uh, for what I don't, yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I, I saw a question, but now I don't see a right hand. Uh, do we have more questions? I can ask a question, hello? Yeah, yeah, sure. But, but uh, let's try to keep it rather, rather short. short yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk, uh, Bjorn. Uh, um, from the formulation that, uh, that you showed, I'm not sure that it is exactly what you have done really. Uh, I don't see any uh, consideration about the expansion of the universe or you at least uh, you didn't consider it as a sort of, uh, I mean, consistent way. Uh, probably you have just added a, const, a constant uh, thing. Uh, uh, am I correct or not? No, no. I mean, these uh, calculations can be pretty much applied to phenomenology nowadays. Of course, in these very early papers uh, from the 2000s, um, when this problem was initially formulated in terms of this schwinger keltisch formalism, uh, this wasn't really in there. But for example, if you look at this equation, and it's not really like, very hard to do this, here we have... Uh, the scale factor for the expansion of the universe, um, which essentially uh, it appears here because m is a dimensionful parameter. Um, so it is uh, in the way I've written the equations here in terms of conformal time, d with respect to d eta. Uh, so it has to be tagged to, to the only dimensionful parameter in this equation, which is the Majorana mass. And uh, the non deviation from equilibrium enters here because we have here um, uh, the, the deviation of the distribution of the sterile neutrinos from equilibrium. And yeah, so this can be entered um, in one way or the other very simply in these equations. And just the way I do it is uh, basically I formulate these equations in Minkowski space. And then I use these conformal coordinates where the metric mm -hmm. tensor is just proportional to the Minkowski metric tensor. And then you tag everywhere where you have a dimensionful parameter, you tag um, the expansion of the universe, and then you can like all the way recover um, what is, uh, what is, uh, I mean, if, if, if the result reduces to the standard results, um, you recover what uh, the dynamics of the expansion of the universe. And let me stress here that this is really something that is coming out of strong washout. So this depends on the dynamics that the ster sterile neutrino correlations have and what dynamics they have uh, depends on the background. And if this is happening a strong washout, this is different from a setting where this is happening in a laboratory. So for example, what um, these authors have done is they have just started to evolve the neutrino distribution from a vanishing initial abundance in a static framework to go to equilibrium. And they haven't mm -hmm. like, included washout or any back reaction. So the calculation is technically correct, but it is not what is happening in the early universe, which is strong washout. And then you get this answer here. Okay. Yes, uh, the, mm. and uh, I suppose you don't consider either uh, the fluctuation, uh, because uh, especially um, consider, uh, considering the, the, I mean, uh, the um, mixing and, and decoherence or, um, uh, somehow, uh, which can which can affect, uh, uh, I mean, uh, many of things that you have you have described. Um, is probably 
considering, uh, I mean, there should be an effect on the, for instance, non goshanity or, uh, yeah, especially three points, uh, three points non goshanity I don't know, have you considered this or not? Okay, I mean, I don't think we are deviating here from um, also the standard program on baryogenesis, leptogenesis. I think uh, why this is typically neglected is simply because, um, I mean, the, the fluctuations are at a level of 10 to the minus five. Um, and also if you are in a, a strong coupling regime, um, that is if you're in a regime where um, uh, these Yukawa couplings are active, then the, these neutrinos wouldn't even freely stream. So you don't have to take account of free streaming. So you can basically have just adiabatic fluctuations and have a separate universe approach to this whole thing. And even if you have free streaming, then I think it would only be a second order effect uh, where you have like different relative temperatures of, uh, of particles in uh, like different regions of the universe. But this yeah. is of uh, order 10 to the minus five and goes on top of uh, the leading order effect here. So I think um, this is at least in this scenario and I think in many other scenarios of baryogenesis, uh, nothing one really has to worry about. I mean, in fact, I'm, I'm trying to have now a project with a student where we are um, like changing the rules of the game that we assume that the sterile neutrino is in equilibrium or at the same temperature as at the plasma at, at the moment at some initial condition. And then we have some free streaming into hot and cold regions. And we try to get leptogenesis then as a second order effect. Uh, but it's, it's really hard to get that, yeah. Um, so it's kind of contrived, but as a matter of principle, stuff like that also works, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bjorn. Let's see. Bjorn again, and uh, we have, and the last speaker of our morning session is Marco Javis. Uh, Marco, can we? Hi. I, uh, did I make you a co-host? Uh, right now, I can't share my screen. It says host this Let image screen sharing. Yes, now you sh should be able to. Ah, yeah. Now it seems to me that it works. Can you all see my screen? Yes. So Marka will tell us about testable scenarios of what the genetics. So please, floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, and thanks a lot for the invitation to this workshop. So the problem, the basic problem of baryogenesis, is that we have only one number, right? We have the baryon to photon ratio. So in principle, there's only one observable. So that makes it pretty difficult to pin down the underlying model from any viewpoint, observation, and experiment, or whatever. So one of the great advantages of leptogenesis is, of course, that it connects the baryonous nature of the universe to other observables in, in the type one seesaw in particular the neutrino masses. So that can make this uh, scenarios more testable than let's say other leptogenesis, baryogenesis scenarios. <coughs> because we don't only have the, the parent to photon ratio to fit to, but also neutrino oscillation data and other observables. So everything I will talk about, I will talk about a few scenarios. Everything that we'll talk about will be scenarios that can effectively be formulated in the framework of the type one seesaw described by this Lagrangian. Up here we have the standard model extended by right handed neutrinos that couple to the uh, lepton doublet L <coughs> and the Higgs doublet H via some matrix F of Yukawa company here to write in the genome, and they can have some Iran mass terms to be engaged singlets. Now, in principle, there will be other fields in the theory, there will be gauge extensions in which this whole thing is embedded, but I'm going to work in the, under the assumption that this Lagrangian like, is the relevant part of the, whatever fundamental theory of nature we have. So after like weak symmetry breaking, it's very well known that we get the light neutrinos, which are, can be associated with the standard model neutrinos. And then <clears throat> there are three heavy mass eigenstates, which are called N here, which are mostly uh, right, the right-handed state, but with a small admixture of the uh, SU2 doublet state, uh, characterized by some mixing angle theta. I will call this mixing angle sometimes theta, sometimes U throughout this talk. But the important point is that these new heavy neutral leptons, these new heavy neutrinos, they have masses that are comparable to the Majorana mass inserted here, and they have weak interactions suppressed by this mixing angle theta. So the two parameters that we need to know, or the two quantities that we need, well, the quantities that we need to know are their masses and their mixing angles, which gives us the mass and the interaction strength of these particles. 
All right, and I will, this is a very field of, actually field of research, so I will try to rush you through a number of different topics to give you an impression of what is the, the current activity and the current status, and if you want to go into some more details and talk about that afterwards. So first, I introduce some testable scenarios, and I look into how, and by testable, I mean that uh, we do not only have neutrino oxidation data, but we can directly find these new particles, these seven neutrinos in experiments. So that's what I, what I mean by testable, okay? If they're too heavy to be found in the experiment, we can still indirectly probe them by neutrino oscillation, like the neutrinos of beta decay and so on, but I'm interested in scenarios where we can find them in colliders. So then I'll go into a bit of detail which kind of uh, probes we have here at hand. And then assuming that we do find these particles at a collider or fixed target experiment and see how we can study their properties to verify that these particles are indeed responsible for the origin of matter and neutrino masses. And I'll focus on two specific properties of them, namely their mixing parameters with the standard modern neutrinos, which can explain the light, which are constrained by the requirement to explain the light, the PMNS matrix, and then proving the Majorana nature of these particles, which is the crucial ingredient of this uh, CESAR mechanism and leptogenesis, of course, that these are Majorana particles. So we really see Majorana. And if I have time at the end, I'll comment a bit on how all of these things can be combined to fully test the uh, biogenesis. All right, let's begin with the mechanisms. So we have seen two talks already about this, so I guess I don't have to spend too much time on this, but let me remind you that there are, okay, baryogenesis requires a deviation from thermal equilibrium. And one way how different uh, baryogenesis or leptogenesis scenarios can be classified is according to the way how this deviation from equilibrium is realized. So in the pure type 1 so this always happens through the deviation of the heavy neutrinos from equilibrium. But when this happens and how this happens depends on their masses and their actions. So in classic thermal leptogenesis, these particles, so this is the uh, x-axis is time and the y-axis is the abundance of these heavy neutrinos. In the classic thermal leptogenesis, these particles are being produced in the Big Bang, come in thermal equilibrium, then freeze out and decay long before the stable run freeze out, which means that the final asymmetry is the one that is produced in the freeze out and decay. This works at very high scales. To then we have resonant leptogenesis, in which this whole process can happen at considerably lower scales, with lower, smaller Yukawa couplings and smaller Majorana masses. So it still happens. So, but the freeze out and decay still happens uh, before the electrode spatter and freeze out. So it, here, the, asymmetry, the final asymmetry is still the one that is produced in the freeze out and decay of these particles. By here, <clears throat> on the right hand side, I've indicated both as freeze out and decay scenario, even though one of them is high scale and one of them is low scale. And then there's the third option, which is often called leptogenesis from neutrino oscillations, in which the equilibration happens sufficiently slow that uh, the equilibration is incomplete by the time that the electric cell one freezes out, which means that the deviation from equilibrium was caused by the freeze, and so this is sometimes called freeze in scenario. All right. And uh, as Björn already mentioned, uh, these scenarios are not really separate from each other. Recent studies have shown that the parameter spaces in which the freeze in and the freeze out operate overlap, and that has been shown by in this paper here, for example. Here you show them. Here's the Majorana mass of the heavy neutrino here, its total mixing angle with standard model. The white region is the one where leptogenesis works here, assuming that there are only two right-handed neutrinos. Within the red curve, the freeze out dominates. Within this <coughs> green curve, it's the freeze in, and you see they overlap. Okay. The in practice, doing such kind of curves is relatively complicated because there are many different effects on it to take account of quantum statistical effects, screening effects, oscillations, <coughs> and so and so. Luckily, Björn has just given us a very nice overview over these effects, so I will not go into these technical details on how to simulate this. Instead, I will focus on the, the results. So um, for that, I will select three benchmark models. And uh, such benchmark models within the type 1 seesaw can be chosen in two different ways. Either one chooses an agnostic approach in which we treat the u cover coupling and the Majora numbers basically as three parameters, allow all various all values that are not excluded experimented. That sounds pretty agnostic. It turns out that even though one doesn't put any, if one assumes, turns out that even in this agnostic approach, if one requires certain, let's say, popular theoretical assumptions such as technical naturalness, it turns out that if one wants large mixing angles that are tested with colliders, one does have to impose a approximate B minus generalized B minus L symmetry on the Lagrangian, so a generalization of the standard model B minus L symmetry. I will come back to that point in a second. 
The second possible, so this is a bottom-up approach. The second possible approach is kind of top-down in the sense that I assume some specific UV completion, which gives me additional global symmetries, specifically uh, discrete symmetries in these uh, masses and um, you cover ma you cover matrix and Majorana mass. And that, of course, reduces the dimensionality of the parameter space, makes the model more predictive, more testable. All right, let's talk about this B minus L symmetry thing first. So the basic problem here is that if you just take the naive seesaw scaling, then the neutrino masses scale as theta squared m, where theta is this mixing angle. And if I take u squared, the absolute value of that thing, then I see the absolute value of this mixing angle should be roughly the ratio between the light neutrino and heavy neutrino masses. At the same time, the production cross section of colliders is also proportional to theta squared. So small neutrino masses generically give you small production cross sections. However, small neutrino masses can be reconciled with sizeable, cu sizeable couplings if they're protected by this generalized B minus S symmetry. So then one imposes the following structure, where one expects the following structure of the Yukawa coupling and the Majorana mass. Note that I have not reduced the number of three parameters here. I've just indicated which of them need to be small and which one need to be large um, in order to have this symmetry. So have all the Greek letters are symmetry breaking parameters, and all the Latin letters are things that can be large in principle. Greek letters should be small parameters, dimensionless ones. Now, and it's it's really just technical naturalness that imposes this. It's the fact that let's say loop corrections to everything should be small compared to treatable. So the phenomenology of this resembles the so-called inverse seesaw model, uh, which was why it's sometimes called inverse seesaw, but really uh, in the inverse seesaw, there are some extra fields. So I prefer to call it simply predictive type on seesaw. Um, it can give a technically natural seesaw with order one recovers and my must be over TV scale. And the resonant enhancement that is needed for leptogenesis comes for free due to this symmetry because mu should be small. So you see, if you look at this my mass, the first two eigenvalues here are quasi degenerate. Now, there are two rare possible realizations or popular realizations of this. One of them I would call the new MSM like scenario, in which uh, basically all these small Greek letters are small, and in particular, this epsilon prime is very small, so that the third heavy neutrino basically decouples and becomes a dark matter candidate. So, this is practically, as far as leptogenesis are concerned, in neutrino masses, a model with only two heavy neutrinos, where the third one can be a dark matter candidate. The third one, one of my collaborators has done mass communism here, which is the scenario in which all of these three have the same mass. Now, this is, of course, not meant to be a political statement of any kind, just in lack of a better term. I'm picking up this casual term that my collaborator used here for the scenario, where all the um, neutrinos have the same heavy neutrinos, have basic quasi-degenerate mass. Now, if one goes in this down this agnostic path, one can typically use the so-called causality bar parameterization, which you see here. The new cover coupling can be parameterized in this way, where I indicate everything that is known and everything that is not known. So here we have the Higgs wave. This is a light neutrino mixing matrix, and we have the light neutrino masses. Then a complex rotation matrix that has some complex rotation angles and the heavy neutrino uh, mass matrix. And everything in green here is things that we know. Everything in red here is things that we do not know at this stage. And depending on whether we are in the model with two or three heavy neutrinos, we have either 11 or 18 free parameters. Here it's listed in detail um, what kind of parameters we have, heavy neutrino masses, mixing angles, phases, and so on. All right, so the second approach is the symmetry-based approach. And so that's far, as far as diagnostic approach is concerned, we do need to be minus our symmetry. Then there's this uh, symmetry-based approach in which we say, well, let's not take the full, ah, yeah, and, and this parameterization fully covers the parameter space. So here's, well, one is fully agnostic when using this parameterization here. <clears throat> However, technical naturalist imposes this uh, minus asymmetry when doing scans. Um, parameter based scans. Then there's the symmetry based approach, which is basically a top down approach where one imposes some symmetries on these matrices, the Yukawa matrix and the Majorana mass. And in that case, of course, the model becomes more predictive because there are less three parameters. So based on this, I'll show you plots for three types of benchmark scenarios. The first one is the BMSL protected type one season in the new MSM level. So practically the new MSM obtained by sending all these uh, small parameters to zero, <coughs> comprises two master generate heavy neutrinos for the CSO and leptogenesis and one dark matter candidate that is almost decoupled and can be neglected for the rest of this talk. So this basically is a model with only two heavy neutrinos as far as leptogenesis and collider phenomenology are concerned. And the lightest standard neutrino is always massless here. So you basically cross out this line, uh, this um, 
column and that column here, the last, the third one. <coughs> Leptogenesis in this model works in this um, parameter space. This is basically the same plot that I've already shown. The main difference being that here, this green contours indicate how much mass degeneracy one needs um, in order to reproduce the observed barrenness of the universe. Now, the second uh, benchmark that I'm going to use is this type 1 seesaw with three heavy neutrino in what I thought mass communist limit, but all the masses are the same. Um, there are three mass degenerate heavy neutrinos, and the lightest sum of the neutrino in this case can be massive or masses. In this case, the leptogenesis parameter space becomes much, much bigger, it turns out. So here on the x-axis is the Majorana mass. <clears throat> on the y-axis is the mixing. Well, it's actually mixing with neurons, but yeah, the mixing angle. All the gray stuff is excluded either by cosmology or direct searches. In the white area, one can reproduce the light neutrino masses. <coughs> and baryogenesis works inside the black curve. So for banishing initial conditions of the heavy neutrinos inside the solid black curve, so this whole entire region here, and for thermal initial conditions uh, inside these dotted curve, which extends down to below 2 GeV, which is quite remarkable. Okay. And this is assuming that the lightest standard model neutrino is massless. Things change a bit if this lightest standard model neutrino is massive. Here we saw assume 0.1 electron volt, you see, huh? going forth and back, you see, there's quite a change. In particular, this makes prompt searches at LHC unfavorable, but still the parameter space is huge. <clears throat> the third type of benchmark that I'm going to use in the next few minutes is a type 1 seesaw with a specific discrete flavor and symmetry symmetry uh, given by this uh, group here uh, that was, well, was, I believe, first uh, motivated by these people here. The great thing here is that if you do this, then there are only five free parameters in the Yukawa coupling, which makes the model much more predictable and tested. <clears throat> in this model, this is what the, uh, this is one example for specific choice of these symmetry parameters and residual symmetries, how the leptogenesis parameter space can look like. Here, yeah, this is again the mass, the mixing. The different curves correspond to different splittings. Kappa measures the splitting of the heavy neutrino masses. Uh, if you marginalize over that, you can roughly say that leptogenesis works anywhere inside these curves, which would slightly change if you change the residual symmetries that one assumes. Okay, good. Now, let's, that was about models and mechanisms. That was already quite long. So let me come to the um, probing. Again. So first, as I said, I'm mainly interested in scenarios where we can actually find these seven neutrinos and colliders. But let me briefly comment on indirect signatures because I think they're also very interesting. There's actually a very large number of observers that are indirectly sensitive to the existence of the seven neutrinos, primarily because they modify the weak currents like, through their mixing. And that includes electric precision data, Neptune universality, neutrino solvida decay, and so on. Neutrino oscillation data, of course. I only want to comment on two of these here. The first one is neutrino solvida decay. Basically here, I just want to remind you of it. It's something that is expected in various models of neutrino mass. <coughs> and it is known that this can be used to probe parts of the genesis parameter space, and there's a promising experimental program. You see, these papers here are all relatively old, so this has been known for quite a while. So let me put the focus here, but it's still important for what I'm going to say later. Let me put, put the focus here on recent development in charged lepton flavor violation, in particular in uh, inside nuclei. <coughs> there have been two recent papers about this that show how powerful this can be to constrain the parameter phase of these heavy neutrinos. Here on the left hand side, you see again mass versus mixing, gray areas excluded. Here you see the power of various different experiments to cut into this parameter space compared to the leptogenesis parameter space. So black line is the leptogenesis parameter space, colorful lines are the experiments. In particular, titanium can be quite strong. And in this plot is basically the same thing, but here you see the barred colors tell you how many different experiments are sensitive to this region, because if you have more than one of them, you can you know, you move towards retestability because you can measure different combinations independently, parameters independent. Good. But the more interesting thing, in my opinion, when it comes to full testability, are those scenarios where one can directly discover these seven neutrinos and searches. And <clears throat> As you can see in this summary plot, there are very many searches that can do this. Again, mass versus mixing, gray area is excluded. Now we have both curves, the one for two heavy neutrinos, so the new MSM is the violet thick curve inside here, the genesis is possible for three heavy neutrinos is inside these orange curves. And then there are these various colorful experimental curves, 
And well, the color code here tells you how far away from being reality they are, ranging from existing experience to future colliders. Okay. The bottom line is here, there are many. Let me just pick this one here, the LHC displays vertex searches, which looks like the most powerful one amongst the existing experiments. So here you see, again, mass versus mixing, which, reach, which region uh, displaced vertex searches at the LHC could probe. I'm just flashing this to those of you who are more cosmologists to give you some feeling what kind of experiments are sensitive uh, to this. So these are the Feynman diagrams. You produce the head neutrino in at the LHC, it travels a bit and then could decays inside the detector with some displacement. Many people have studied this, so we are not the only ones. All right, but this is a workshop on cosmology, so I'm not going to talk about the LHC very much. If we discover these particles, we can actually learn very many things by studying their properties. And here there is a list of incomplete list of references to what we can learn <coughs> um, about these particles from studying their properties. I am only going to focus on two specific aspects. One of them is the mixing parameters, and one of them is the Majorana nature. <laughs> so mixing parameters. Let's first into consider, take into consideration constraints from neutrino oscillation data. So if the right hand neutrinos are supposed to generate the right hand neutrino, uh, the light neutrino masses, then the requirement to reproduce the correct PMNS matrix constrains their properties. The requirement to reproduce the PMNS matrix constrains the way how the heavy neutrinos can mix with the standard models. And this is often displayed in terms of these triangle plots where they show you what is the relative strength of the interaction of these, have the mixing of these heavy neutrinos with the different standard model flavors with electron, mu, tau flavor, normalized to their total mixing, sum over standard model flavors. The great thing about displaying it in this way is that these plots basically are independent of the heavy neutrino mass, and everything in here is allowed region is determined by the PMNS parameters alone. <coughs> So here you see the allowed region for normal and inverted hierarchy with current neutrino oscillation data, which tells us that this is already falsifiable because if you discover these particles, you can see where they sit. Assuming that there are two heavy neutrinos. <coughs> this is for two heavy neutrinos, so for the new MSM. And here we see how this will evolve once Dune comes into play, or alternatively a hyper K. Um, so they see then. Well, these different curves assume different values for the mixing angles, light neutrino mixing angles. And you see, once a certain value of the light of the ordering and the light neutrino mixing angle is measured, one has to be on one of these curves. And going around these curves corresponds to varying the Majorana phase. So if I discover the heavy neutrino, let's say here, by knowing where along these curves is, I can infer information about the Majorana phase. That at the same time then allows us to predict the rate of neutrinoless double beta decay, which is now for the case of inverted hierarchy shown here. So I don't expect you to remember all the details. The main point here is this model is very predictive. Neutrino oscillation data, um, neutrinoless double beta decay, make, good predict uh, make very testable predictions of the properties of these neutrinos in the middle of minimum model with only two heavy neutrinos in the MSM like model. Once you have three heavy neutrinos that can take part in all of this, the predictions from neutrino oscillation data become, well, less predictive, obviously. And what you see in this triangle here is the region that is allowed in this triangle is determined by the mass of the lightest standard model neutrino. So if this mass is very small, then you are inside this red curve, which is quite similar to what we saw here before, just the triangle has been rotated in this uh, plot. So this is this. Red region is uh, this red region. But if the mass of the lightest standard molecule is heavier, then this region becomes bigger and basically the whole triangle can be built. On the other hand, so this is with three heavy neutrinos. On the other hand, if I impose this flavor mixing symmetries on the three heavy neutrinos, so if I impose the discrete flavor symmetries that I mentioned before on the model, then it becomes very predictive again. So here are these triangle plots for uh, normal and inverted uh, <coughs> mass ordering. In the presence of one example of these discrete flavor symmetries that I mentioned, you see you're really constrained to this half moon here, which again makes the model very predictive. Okay, but this is all neutrino oscillation data. I promised to talk about leptogenesis. So let's go back to the minimal model with two heavy neutrinos and see what leptogenesis can say. And here, leptogenesis can make some uh, valuable predictions <coughs> for where you can be. So what these plots again tell you is again these triangle plots for normal and inverted hierarchy of light neutrino masses. And again, it's like e mu tau, where you, the, the mixing is e mu tau, the relative size of the mixing. But 
And the green region is what is allowed by neutrino oscillation data, but the color shading within the green region tells us the maximal total mixing for which leptogenesis works for a given flavor mixing pattern. Yeah. And what you notice is the darkest, so the most testable are these darkest color fields, the largest mixings, <coughs> where the chances to find this other collider are the biggest. They are always at the edge here of these triangles. Yes, here, either in this corner or here at the edge. So this can be uh, understood. And if you would make the same plot for three heavy neutrinos, basically the whole triangle would be filled and there would be no such productivity that you have to be at the edge. <coughs> So let's briefly try to understand where this difference comes from. I don't show the plot for three because it's just a field triangle. Let's briefly understand where this comes from by looking at the dynamics during leptogenesis. Okay. So at zero temperature, the mass basis of the heavy neutrinos is the one where the Majorana mass M is diagonal. Now, in the B minus L symmetry, I can define kind of interaction basis via these spin offs here, which are linear combinations of these uh, S and W, your S and your W, so linear, linear combinations of the two states that you have in the base where Majorana was diagonal, to which you can assign a clear lepton charge, <clears throat> okay? And the point here is that for, for large temperatures, thermal masses dominate. So the mass basis becomes the basis uh, spanned by these factors here. While at low temperatures, the mass basis is the one spanned by nu r1 and nu r2. At high temperatures, the mass basis is the one spanned by these two here. So there's a rotation in the mass basis as the system evolves. Now, just as a reminder, this is the new kappa coupling uh, in the mass basis. So I have neglected the third one because I'm using an assembly-like scenario. And you see in this direction, it's the B minus S symmetry that dictates the structure, the relative size of the columns, while the relative size of the rows is given by neutrino oscillation data, what you saw in this plot here. <clears throat> now, this is the U cover coupling in the interaction basis. So you see in this interaction basis, you have one um, column that has a large coupling and one column that has a small coupling. So in the interaction basis, one of these uh, mass eigenstates become, becomes very feebly coupled or very weakly coupled due to the symmetry minus L symmetry. So what happens here? So if you have large U squared, then this idea comes into equilibrium, this stronger coupled state comes into equilibrium very early because there's a large mixing. So the deviation from equilibrium that is needed for leptogenesis is produced by the fact that the second state here, this one here, has suppressed interactions. Okay, and that means that way you can still have a deviation from equilibrium in spite of relatively large couplings. However, when the temperature approaches the mass, so-called lepton number violating interactions become efficient. And then the second state here also becomes <clears throat> yet sizable interactions. Then both of them are relatively strongly coupled. And the only way to avoid complete washout is have to have, have a hierarchy in this direction, so in the, um, from one row to another. So to have one standard model that are much weaker coupled than the other one, so that this standard model data doesn't get washed out. Uh, Mark, you have five minutes. Oh, I see. OK, thanks. <clears throat> So the story changes quite a lot if you have three heavy neutrinos, because in that case, you have this uh, third column here. <clears throat> so you have one state that is basically not entangled in this. So these two here form a so-called Stuttgart pair. The third one here is basically not entangled in that way, and it can do whatever it wants. So it can maintain a large deviation from equilibrium, even in the presence of lepton number violating interactions. Now you might say, well, if this state is very cheaply coupled here, it just doesn't matter, it just decouples like the dark matter candidate in USM. But that is not true if you're in this so-called mass form in this case, where all three have very similar masses, because if all have very similar masses, then there can be large mixings between these things due to thermal, thermal corrections. Even, <clears throat> and therefore, all three states can receive sizable couplings. As a result of that, <clears throat> This third, there's a state here that can, can maintain a deviation from equilibrium, even if the couplings are very large. That means that A, we do not need a hierarchy amongst the standard model um, flavors to avoid washouts. So we do not have plots like, like these ones here. The other thing is it implies that the total mixing can be much larger, which explains why, if you look at this kind of plot here, this line is several orders of magnitude higher than this line, right? That makes it really so much larger. It makes it much more uh, likely to see the set collide. 
All right, then there are some interesting dynamical phenomena, for example, uh, well, yeah, I, I don't have time to go this into, into detail here, but there are some interesting phenomena here. If you have these only, if, if you have a moderate degeneracy to begin with, then thermal effects can cause a kind of MSW-like resonance and resonantly enhance the production in this scenario, which is kind of a cool thing to happen, but since you now already warned me that my time is running out, I'm gonna skip over this <coughs> and go to the last thing that I want to talk about, namely testing the Majorana nature of these particles. So <coughs> what's the problem here? The problem here is that, well, in principle, these are Majorana particles, <coughs> but we had to impose this B minus L symmetry in order to get um, couplings that are large enough to get sizable production cross sections at the collider at the same time have small new genome masses. Now you would say, well, in principle, the D minus L symmetry should suppress lepton number violating decays because, uh, well, there's a symmetry that forbids this and lepton number is approximately conserved. And the way how that happens is destructive interference between two different heavy neutrinos in this diagram. Um, well, this is the diagram for this particular process at the LHC that I showed you before. And in this particular process, this the way how this B minus L symmetry would manifest itself is by destructive interference between contributions from two of these heavy neutrinos. However, we know, of course, that this B minus L symmetry is not exact because it's broken. Otherwise, there would be no neutrino masses. So, can the breaking that produces small neutrinos be sufficient to make lepton number violation observable at the LHC? <clears throat> the answer is yes. Naively, you would say this is parametrically suppressed by the small neutrino masses. However, these the heavy neutrinos can oscillate inside the detector. These oscillations can destroy the coherence of the quantum state. So what determines whether the lepton number violations effectively suppressed at the collider or not is the ratio between the mass splitting and the width of these particles. <clears throat> and using sort of natural news considerations, one can see where in this mass fixing plane one expect the lepton number violation to be unsuppressed or uh, to be suppressed. So here you can really see the Majorana nature. But that's not the end of the story. When it comes to leptogenesis, we in principle also want to know the mass splitting of these particles, which is a very important parameter for leptogenesis. And these oscillations of the heavy neutrinos inside the detector, they uh, can in principle allow us to access this. So we have already seen this plot before. Now, if these oscillations happen, if it, this is a long lived particle, then these oscillations will happen along the time of flight inside the detector. And depending on where the particle decays, which is a random process, it would either be a lepton number conserving or also lepton number violating. So here in these plots, you see where these people here, they have thought this out, which is the sort of the distance, a meter, and then the ratio of the lepton number violating and lepton number conserving decays in an idealized world. And here a little bit more realistically as a function of, well, the flight time in seconds here. Now this can be compared <coughs> to the oscillation time that is needed in leptogenesis, okay? So here you see, this is the mass splitting, the physical mass splitting of the heavy neutrinos, and this is the oscillation time in the early universe. And the blue region is where leptogenesis is allowed. And by comparing this axis to that axis, you see that there is an overlap between the region where these things can be spatially, the oscillations can be spatially resolved at the detector and where leptogenesis works. So we can potentially probe this. All right, in the last minute, I will just, um, promote the idea of testing these kind of things by complementarity between different frontiers a bit more. And for that, as a reminder, I flash again this um, Casas Ibarra parameterization. Again, this is a cover matrix. And here in green are things that we know, and reds are the things that we don't know. Let us look at the minimal model with only two heavy neutrinos, so the new MSM like scenario. Then there are only six unknown parameters. There's a U missing here. The average mass of the heavy neutrinos, their mass splitting. <coughs> And then inside this uh, mix, this R matrix, there's a complex angle, it's real part and imaginary part, the delta phase in one Majorana phase. So the average mass can be resolved kinematically. The delta M can be, if we are lucky, can also be resolved kinematically, but otherwise by these oscillations between that number by adding that number to the case. Um, the real part of this mixing angle can be resolved by either looking at the relative size of the couplings of the two uh, heavy neutrinos to a given standard model generation, or by neutrino double beta decay, which is something that I have not had time to go into detail, but yes, this is possible. <coughs> but the imaginary part of this angle is determined by the overall strength of these couplings. Delta can be measured at some neutrino oscillation experiment, and then alpha can be extracted from these triangle plots that we that I already showed you where I said if you go around the line, then you can measure, basically measure alpha. 
So that shows us that for two heavy neutrinos, in principle, all parameters in this Lagrangian can be extracted from the experiment, and in principle, we could predict the Baroness Meter of the universe and compare it to the observed. Of course, in practice, some of these measurements will have very sizable error bars, in particular this delta m here and this field part of omega. One would have to be super lucky to be in the regime where one can really make an accurate prediction. However, the fact that it is in principle possible, I think, is already very encouraging. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, so leptogenesis in the type 1 seesaw-based scenarios is possible for almost any Majorana mass roughly above the pion mass. And there are various experiments that can find these heavy neutrinos and study their properties less probe the origin of um, neutrino mass and the baron asymmetry. And complementarity between the different frontiers is absolutely crucial in order to test specific models. And then I have shown you three benchmark models, the minimum model, the so-called EMSM, which practically has only two heavy neutrinos, which is fully testable, as I showed on the last slide, all parameters can be constrained. The model with three heavy neutrinos, and, but for this model, for the first one, leptogenesis works inside this uh, violet hashed region here. And if you add three heavy neutrinos during leptogenesis, the parameter space for leptogenesis works, becomes much, much larger. That's great news. On the other hand, there are also more parameters, so it becomes more difficult to make testable predictions. And finally, I mentioned briefly the possibility to add discrete Clayband CP symmetries, impose them on the Lagrangian to make the model with three heavy neutrinos more testable. All right, thank you very much for your attention. And sorry if I went over time. Thank you, Mark, <laughs> for this uh, nice overview. So it's time for questions. <clears throat> All right, that was a lot of information. I guess everybody has to digest that a little bit. Yeah, also, I guess people are hungry, <clears throat> uh, but so we're going into the lunch thing. Uh, so, so I have, um, yeah, I have maybe a, a sh sh short question myself. I so, about this uh, um, for, for phases in the in the case of in your previous slide maybe uh, in the case yep. of uh, two two channels so this alpha uh, what do you mean flavor mixing pattern um, by my that I mean this so, ah, okay, so, so the, okay. the relative size this, the relative size of these H and L mixings so this is the current situation this is how we expect but let's look at what we have now. So in this triangle, which is the relative size to E mu tau, which I think you're familiar with this kind of triangle plots. <laughs> um, basically, um, where in this triangle you sit is governed by so the relative. So we don't know if heavy neutrinos exist, but if they exist in this model, then we know what is the relative size of their coupling to the different standard model generations. You must be inside these regions. And the reason why these regions is two-dimensional is because they are basically determined by the TMLS parameters, which are two phases. So if you measure one of the phases, you basically boil that down to a, well, approximately one-dimensional thing, which is like the circle or ellipse that goes around. So then the position along this ellipse, where along this ellipse you're sitting, basically tells you or is sensitive to the Majorana phase. So if you find, let's say, an HNL that sits here with it, or having a tuning that sits here in this triangle, then you can sort of extract from that information about what is the value of the Majorana phase. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So I don't see uh, more questions. So maybe we, we can open the um, uh, breakout rooms. So um, what I did, I have opened three rooms. Maybe the speakers, if they have time, uh, they can go to uh, corresponding yeah, room uh, in the same order as, uh, as the talks. Uh, and then, then we, we can keep discussing because there, there were many questions. Uh, uh, so, yeah, let's see. Sorry, where should I see this breakout rooms? I think they're not so, open. Ah, okay, true. Yes, now, now they are, right? Yeah. So in, uh, in more, well, depend, depending on the size of your screen, uh, you can click more, yeah. or we can, in, in principle, we can leave here. There are yeah, not so yeah. many of us. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah. Yeah, maybe we fit here. 
Yeah, that would be the easiest. Yep. So maybe I have a question to Marco, uh, actually. There were uh, two recent papers discussing constraints on uh, different mixing parameters from uh, uh, charge uh, lepton flavor violation. Can you comment on, on that? Uh, I guess you had that on, on your slide. Yes, I guess let me just... Uh... Yeah, Inar actually was one of the authors, so I don't know, maybe it's a question to Inar. Sergei, Sergei, was, yeah, Sergei, Sergei was, was another author. Yeah, and Sergei was another author, so I don't know to whom this question is addressed. I, I was going to say, I can try to answer it, but since uh, the, the, the chairman currently is an author of this paper, I would probably pass it on to Inar. <laughs> I have it on the slide, so I can flash the slide if you want, Inar. So, uh, yeah, maybe that, that would help. Also, also, Sergey is here. So, uh, Sergey had the first paper on this subject, uh, like a uh, long time before I was born. So, <laughs> so, so I think it's this 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 slide here, right? There's, this is the paper yes. from uh, now. You and yeah. Sergey collaborators. Uh, yeah, sorry, so, this, uh, this, sorry, this is Sergey. Yes, this is Sergey. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, the black line in the left plot is uh, is uh, leptogenesis, I believe, and the colored lines is the sensitivity of proposed experiments, in particular this muon to electron conversion. And you can see that this uh, those experiments will probe uh, like deeply in leptogenesis, free H channel leptogenesis region, uh, with very heavy masses. Uh, so this is this is quite uh, quite spectacular. And the, the, the plot goes further to the right. In the right plot, the, you see that it goes to almost P, PEV region. And the, the dark gray thing is um, just unitarity, uh, three-level unitarity, basically gamma equal to M, the, the K is equal to M. So beyond this, we, the theory is non, non perturbative. And yeah, in the right plot, the colorful bands show how many different experiments will test this and uh, we did some uh, some uh, like fake simulations. Suppose we have uh, we have uh, detected signals in this light green or dark green region. Um, so some so, some sig free experiments measured something. Then we can from that, assuming that there are two HNLs, we can tell uh, what is the mass and what is the total mixing. Basically, the imaginary part of Omicron with uh, quite surprising precision. Uh, so that's that's this, this that's the status. I don't know if Sergey wants to add something. So the left plot is for three HNLs. And... Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Well, both so, of them. Uh, that doesn't uh, matter both of much. Them. Ah, okay. It's it's uh, so so the right uh, right plot is just experimental sensitivity. So so like how many experiments will be sensitive? It's for lept uh, leptogenesis where it matters uh, the most. I, I, I mean, I, I can I can go more technical to, to to explain why two and three doesn't really matter for the bounds. But maybe we we have some questions before. Uh, there, there was this question by Valerie about. Uh, the Iraq phase, and uh, I'm eager to, to to know the answer myself. I I can try to 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 rephrase it maybe in yet another way. Suppose we start from uh, lepti uh, from lepton sector. We have uh, Yukawa couplings, uh, HNL masses, and then we get uh, the uh, the parameters, the observable parameters. So basically, a delta is some combination a combination of um, CP phases coming from Yukavas and so on. So the question is: del is delta invariant uh, under the change of the basis? So so does it depend on the basis of Yukavas, which we take? No, 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 no. That wasn't the question. The question was. So, yeah, what? The question was, uh, of course, delta is uh, you know invariant thing, right? Because it's just a physical quantity; you just measure it, right? So it's an invariant invariant number. However, the question is, uh, what exactly do you mean when you say that that's the only parameter? <laughs> that that's the only parameter that uh, 
that violates CP. Okay. What is the invariant meaning of that? Okay. Uh, there are invariants that you said, I mean, Delta probably is an invariant, uh, some complicated combination of all the, you, you know, Yukawas, etc. But there must be other invariants because there are more, in principle, there are more, uh, uh, more uh, CP validating parameters in your theory, right? So what exactly do you, do you set equal to zero? when you say that you just have one delta, nothing else. That was my question. Or, or you can't simply say that, you can't simply answer this question. Is there an you know, affirmative answer to this question? Yeah, I wonder if Sergei is around. Because that's a question to him, right? I actually, I actually don't see him among. The no, he is. Uh, his name is somehow here, but whether he ah, is, Pitko, uh, yes. exactly. whether he is around. I, I see the name. <laughs> yeah, me too. No. Maybe he, he left. So. Uh, but just to partially answer this question, so in principle, uh, th there are papers which list uh, the environments which you can construct, uh, independent environments. Uh, I mean, they, so, so they, in some, somewhat orthogonal basis, they, they don't specify whether it's delta or something else. Uh, but uh, I, I know Pilar, Hernandez, and others, Mark, maybe you know some other papers as well. They construct uh, a set of environments uh, out of uh, analog of this Yarskog uh, JCP environment. Uh, so, so there are higher environments. Uh, I don't know if this answers your question or not, uh, because I think, I'm not sure if the, the, the set by Pilar is complete. I think there was a paper by Shunzhou. Shunzhou who constructed, I believe, all the invariants, but I don't remember the details. He had, yeah, he gave some analysis, but uh, now I can't recall all the details. Yeah, if so, what, what does it mean? Do you equate one invariant to the other, or what? If you say that you have just delta. That was my question. Yeah, uh, well, then the answer in, in terms of invariance uh, could be the following. Uh, I don't remember how many phases you have in general, maybe six. Then you say that uh, five of these invariants you put to zero and leave uh, just one around. Yeah, probably that's it, but uh, yeah, but, but uh, don't mean. Why, yeah, yeah. Why then the question is, of course, why? Why, why, do, exactly. why, why do you do so? This particular invariant is not zero. Where, whereas others are, are zero. But I think in general, you will not get one particular invariant that is non zero because if you express all these invariants in terms of, let's say, if you take the Kazas and parameterization and plug it into the different invariants, then, okay, of course, you can rewrite the invariants in various different ways, but in general, you will not. I mean, theta is nothing special, right? It's some combinations of some things in the DVB theory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and probably though. The relationship between, you know, most natural invariants will involve, you know, parameters like ratios of masses and stuff like that. Yes. So yes. Setting that, saying that delta is just one single invariant that does not, that, that, that doesn't vanish, would probably imply sort of non-trivial relationship between other simple invariants. I would su suspect. So it's kind of, you know, weird. Uh, I actually have a question, but it's again to Sergey, and he doesn't seem to be around. <laughs> so may maybe somebody knows, because Sergey, he mentioned uh, this uh, neutrino option, and I'm kind of very much confused with that. So what, do what does it mean? Uh, uh, maybe anybody knows. Isn't that the idea that the electric scale gets generated by the uh, by radiative corrections from, from the seesaw or something like that? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, th this words, uh, but uh, I'm not sure I, I can buy these words because uh, what does it mean precisely that it's generated? Uh, because uh, electronic symmetry breaking is kind of arbitrary parameter, so there must be some hypothesis uh, uh, beside that. And uh, I just wanted to know what these hypotheses are because it sounds kind of strange to me. 
Yeah. I'm not sure. I thought it's some cool in Weinberg like thingy, but I'm not. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 but, but I have uh, elementary questions. There are not only uh, masses of uh, neutrinos, there are uh, masses of quarks, uh, then there are different scales. So what does it mean precisely? So I just wanted to, to learn. I, I was ignoring. Well, that's probably a question to Sergey. <laughs> yeah, that's yes, a question but also to Sergey. <laughs> or to Sylvia. Sylvia is not here. Sylvia passed away. No, no. By the way, I also had another comment to Sergei, which <laughs> <laughs> because he mentioned that he used this Olysses uh, code. And last time I talked to Jessica Turner, which was just before the pandemic, I believe that all these effects that Bjorn mentioned were not included in this Olysses code. So Sergei yes, said actually. that he, he would be surprised if they're not included, but my impression is that they are not included because that's what Jessica said. Because I asked her precisely that question at some meeting at CERN like two years ago. Or so. Uh, so I actually checked uh, the code and uh, the quantum kinetic equations which they use, uh, they come from this paper by uh, Steve Blanchet and Pasquale de Barry and others uh, from 2013. I, I sent the link to, into the chat. Uh, so to me, it seems that th those effects are not there, but I, I didn't read the papers carefully, of course, Did, didn't read the paper carefully, of course. Because, uh, so I think based on Jessica's statement and your checking of the code, we can tentatively conclude that they're not <laughs> not included. I would say, I don't know. Yes, but in principle, I guess our yeah depends on the mass because our codes must be they have all this. But, but Jessica said that they do. <clears throat> so Jessica said that she would like to include this at some point. So uh, maybe she did. You know, so I can't. Even use degree. Uh, hard back to say. Then, yeah. Back then it didn't. Back then it didn't. Uh, Valeria, Valeria, you, you are muted. Do something else. I have my treatment now. So see you. See you then later on. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I also don't know you. Yeah, we will say we will have to have uh, lunch. Lunch. lunch at some stage. Yes. Yeah. So I.